Sorry, what, 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 what's your question? Do you need help with keeping an eye on the FBA? No, it's, it's, it's on now. We are on now. So we have to sell the correct things because it's, it's there out, out there for, uh, for prosperity. So good, um, good morning, the people uh, in the state side and um, good evening, our brothers and sisters in our siblings in, um, in Mother Africa in Kenya. And um, today we are discussing the uh, hot topic, um, religious trauma. And um, our panelists will introduce themselves as they speak. So um, today, Sai is back after he ditched us last week. Um, so Sai will do his usual nice speech that I can never emulate, and then we will go on. So Sai, go ahead. OK, so. Um... Hi everyone, my name is Sad Jackson. I'm a <clears throat> um, life and transitions coach, and I specialize in creating money experiences that help individuals and institutions. Just, just give me one minute. Sire, your audio is not very clear. Is it clear now? What do, 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 do we, we can hear you, but it could be better. Uh, I'm clear right now. It's very clear. Stay there. The apple. I have answer. Is it clear right now? Yeah. Okay, good. So hi everyone again. Sorry for that. My my name is Sarah Jackson. I'm a um, learning designer and a life and transition coach. What and the, in simple English this just means I design learning experiences end to end, experiential, and my passion is to help individuals and organizations um, navigate important transitions without losing voice, vision, or values. Um, this must have been 2000 um, or 2001. And I remember vividly I was uh, at the gate of uh, my local church back in Kenya. And I was literally pleading, I was at the gate of the, of the church. I, I, I attend a very big church in Kenya. And at that time, I think I was a youth leader or I was in leadership for the young people. And I remember standing at the gate pleading with a member who was leaving, a youth member who was, who was leaving. Um, she'd been um, torn to tatters by the tongues of gossip. And right there within the church, and all manner of nasty, nasty things had been said to her about her um, and she, she had it. All my attempts to, to plead and you know, try and present different perspectives were just not selling. And I wish I said I was successful. The only slight measure of success I have is to report that she didn't leave faith altogether. What she did is she moved to another church. That's a microcosm of individuals we're experiencing today's topic of religious trauma. She chose to deal with it by moving across to another church, but other individuals, not so. Individuals have done worse, uh, way worse, um, under the influence of religious um, trauma. Whether you, in, you think of individuals who strap explosives on themselves and blow themselves and blow other people in the name of religion? Or do you think of individuals who do honor killings because certain religion um, dictates um, require them to do so? Or when it is explosive um, reports of religious figures um, abusing children, especially boys, or when you think of the injustices that have been done in, God, in the name of God or covered up with the name of God, from everything like domestic issues that are not sold because of a certain religious um, preposition or places where girls are unfairly treated because of, and the, the only reason given is religion. And yeah, yeah, we, this topic never quite goes. Um, when we think about ideas like um, colonialism that happened in a good measure in many locations abated um, by religion. And when you think of slavery, which was in many cases defended from religious positions. Let me hear sidetrack and say, and also ended by religious um, um, positions. 
um, faith has not performed too well when it comes to domains like violence, the meeting out of trauma resulting in trauma. I, I wish we had a better score. The debate can go on and on about what is religious trauma. Um, is it trauma inflicted because of church doctrines or mosque doctrines or Hindu doctrines or Islam doctrines? Or is it trauma that um, arises because of the behavior of individuals within communities of faith, regardless of what that community is? We can discuss till the cows come home about the definitions, but one thing is for sure, Religious trauma is unique in that many people turn to religion for relief, for hope, for direction. And when the thing you turn to becomes the source of um, trauma, what the thing that you turn to for relief, for hope, becomes a source of trauma, then it becomes an extremely disorienting experience. There's something about religion or someone's faith that goes way deeper than we properly can explain. I'm, my sister's on the call and I'm not too sure I'll stop myself with explosives for her sake, but individuals do that for religion's sake. So there's a part that religion cuts that <clears throat> many other things do not cut. And therefore when that thing now becomes a source of traumatizing or brainwashing or doing any of those other things, it's something that is serious. Again, I expect a very emotive discussion because, hey, let's just face it, whether you're an atheist who believes in the non-existence of God, or you are who believes in the existence of God, religion is never emotionally neutral. And therefore, I think also that emotiveness of religion comes with it the accompanying desire almost always to defend it, protect it, even in the face of glaring mistakes by religion. However, I think a proper, I hope that a proper balance can be struck today because certainly religion has brought a lot of good in the world and certainly the misuse of religion has brought a lot of evil um, in it. But I hope that somehow at the end of the day, we can be able to understand trauma. I have good news for the story I began with. My friend not only moved to another church, but later relocated, um, I think to America and is still practicing faith. I hope and trust that her experiences in the past have provided someone's education today. And in a similar way, I pray that as we go through um, the whole discussion, our experiences will form someone's positive education today. Back to you, studio. To Merudi studio, Okay, so, um, so, with all that said, we still need to define what religious trauma is. Um, and this, the, the I, I throw this to the to the psych team, and that's Mukimba and Kate. If you're able to 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 talk, uh, so Mukimba, because I can see your face, um, just go ahead. What what is religious trauma? Hey, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Mukimba Rahedi. I am a counselor and I am a young adults coach. Um, I think we had also done the adverse childhood experiences. I found out an amazing term for religious trauma, which is called adverse religious experiences. So it's basically ours, yeah? And it's the traumatic injury caused by abuse of faith and abuse of the experiences that happen within faith. So it's not limited to just Christian religion, also to every other religion out there. Um, Advice religious experiences are as a result of abuse of power by the people in authority. And like Saya said, um, also bad behavior within the community in the church, uh, in, in, the, in the religious. I feel like I'm always taken back to saying the word church because I'm Christian. But yeah, it's in all types of religious situations where at best religious experiences are the traumatic injury caused by the, the abuse of power, the manipulation of power and the manipulation of doctrine as well. And as well, the misbehavior of the people in the community. Um, Kate, Kate are you able, if you're able to speak, um, do you want to add on to that definition? 
Okay, unmute yourself, kid. Uh, what I wanted to say, sorry, I'm driving. I couldn't miss this, and uh, there was an occasion. Uh, she has actually given a very good definition, but for everyone to understand, I think it's it's nice if I uh, give an example. I like the way you said that adverse, um, that traumatic experience that you get, uh, which is caused by the main thing that causes those traumatic experiences is um, where you practice your faith. Let's say like that. I like that she has actually said it's not only the church, the Christian base, but we have also other uh, religious, um, we get a tra religious tra trauma from other religions like Muslim, Hindu, all of that. Because at the end of the day, there's something that has actually been put. We were all, like, there's some of us who have been, uh, when you're born, even when you're growing up, there's what you've been exposed to. Uh, you can ask most people, like, why are you Christian? They'll just tell you, I got, like, I, from the time that I started, I was being raised up, we used to go to church. Someone else tell you, we used to go to the voice. The other person tell you, we used to go to the, uh, whichever, whichever place they used to actually go and practice their faith so basically there's that within our churches there are those we've been brought up to believe there's words uh, you can do that is bad and that's good so when it, you lean more towards the bad the punishment or the consequences that follow is what we are talking about today what are those what are those experiences that people have experienced when they did something that is against the the the, the, the beliefs of the faith that they are practicing or within the, uh, the how can I, where they go actually, is it, is it in the mosque, is it in the church? There's what we have actually said that is not, uh, that we actually go through. There's something else that you said that I really liked is, um, it has actually been said. Uh, those traumatic, we are saying they're traumatic experiences because by the time you're realizing there's something that is happening to you and, uh, it's against what you have been like being brought up to believe within your faith and you want to get out of it there's something we said about the lady who was unable to actually get out of it or, and when she did it was deemed that it was so wrong so when we're addressing this religious trauma today we also want to talk about what are the those consequences is what we are going to concentrate on and what those people who experience it what they, can you hear me Yes. You can hear me. Uh, what what did they suffer and what are the consequences? I think that's what we can just actually put on. Okay. Um, Steve, on your end as as a as a as a chaplain, um, first of all, explain to people the difference between a chaplain and a normal pastor. And then um, just is is this something that's taught in pastor school what's pastor school again theology school and are you do you realize that it's a it's a problem or what, is this something new to you well thank you i um well the, there's quite a bit of a difference between uh pastors and chaplains or pastoral work and chaplains see um And there are also areas where um, there's a lot of similarity in what we do. Um, uh, mainly, uh, pastors would uh, would serve Christian communities. Um, chaplains would uh, would serve uh, all different religious communities. Uh, so you can have like a Christian chaplain or um, serving Christians or non-Christians. You can have a Muslim chaplain. There's even atheist chaplains. Um, uh, very interesting schools like Harvard actually admitting even atheists or um, <laughs> studies in Master of Divinity, you know, um, and still becoming uh, chaplains. <laughs> um, so, so, so there's uh, there's overlaps, but uh, I'm not sure you can hear about a, a Muslim pastor or something like that or a Hindu. Hindu pastor, but you can have a Hindu chaplain. Um, I'm not sure you can hear about a, a pastor serving in a school or in the military, but you have chaplains. So we, um, I think when you're a chaplain, you have a little more latitude in the areas where you can operate and the kind of people you can 
um, you have access to or um, or the kind of people that have access to you. And so the the training, much as it starts off more or less the same, uh, there's a divergence somewhere. And for me, um, I think the the chaplaincy track, especially here in the West, um, I tend to see that it has a little more appreciation of um, the facts of life, you know, the fact that uh, by the time you have a caregiver going out to give care to people, you need to have this um, caregiver cared for first, you know, like this person who's going to care for others, um, in what state of mind, uh, in what state is he physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, financially, like there's, there's, there's solid attempts to try and get chaplains to actually address some of these things personally, uh, identify them in themselves, walk um, certain journeys like self-awareness, self-care, you know, um, address certain issues like traumas that uh, they have faced, or even at least identify, you know, what kind of traumas they have faced and how this can likely impact how um, they minister, so to speak, to other people. So that's a critical training that uh, chaplains get in what is called uh, clinical pastoral education, which is becoming minimum requirement for most chaplaincy uh, work. But we don't have a lot of that in uh, pastoral training. Um, in pastoral training is, uh, is nice, but um, thing is you just go to school um, when you feel you're called. And sometimes even pastors just feel they're called and they just plunge into the the gospel ministry and start working even without theological training even without uh all you know addressing all these other psychological emotional issues that that involved that are involved in different aspects of ministry so most pastors are up against you know a very uphill task you know when it comes to ministry and it's very challenging um, and that's why you have this phrase, hurt people, hurt others. Uh, so you, sometimes you have people who are hurt personally, and then um, you have this cycle of dif- dysfunction where people who've been hurt are hurting others because they're not even aware, you know, that they have been hurt and that they're even hurting, hurting others. So we end up with things like this religious uh, trauma. So in a nutshell, um, there's, there's significant differences between pastoral work and, um, and chaplaincy work. But also, yeah, in pastoral work, you don't have as much uh, solid addressing of some of these issues that we are going to talk about uh, here today. So you really zone into the theological aspects. And like, for instance, for myself, uh, after I did my bachelor's in theology and uh, got into ministry, my first three and a half years, literally, uh, I spent them learning from my church members, very very interestingly in Nairobi, you know. Um, so I found myself encountering a lot that I had not even studied in school, you know, things to do with administration, things to do with management, you know, of a big church. And here you've got people that do this on a daily basis, you know, running big companies, big corporations, uh, big, you know, government uh, offices and stuff, and they're bringing their skills. And I think I was privileged because I was in a church that allowed these people to exercise these gifts and so I was able to learn from them but in many places I've seen people with such gifts being silenced not even being allowed to exercise some of those gifts within the church and you have pastors struggling um, to run you can imagine running simple things like boards councils and stuff like that and you've got you've got a CEO of you know a multi-million dollar trillion dollar maybe company seated there and wondering you know (laughs) I've got something to say, and it becomes a bit of a problem. So anyway, my first three years were actually learning. It was more of just learning. And and I realized, you know, in the church, there's people who've got skills, who've got knowledge, but but sometimes we come on board as pastors, you know, and we come across as know-it-alls and push away people sometimes. And the church doesn't become as thriving as it can possibly be. So... Uh, let me stop at that. Uh, if you've got any other questions, we'll address them going forward. But yeah. And, and I think that this point came up last week, last week when you discussed um, 
work workplace trauma and um and and we realize that the hr is loaded with so much stuff we need to teach people what hr is and we need to empower uh, uh, our hrs and so the, in the same way we need to empower i had never thought about um about all that stuff but and so because my, um i have a power, let, let me let's 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 start with the things that i think um lead, um lead us to this situation we 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 call religious trauma and so uh, let me just share my screen uh, and the, and i will give you my thought process as usual the usual um question are you able to see my screen mm -hmm. okay um i just want us to discuss powers um Sir, this is your question. I know I, I surprised you with things on, on the DD, but you flow with me. Let's just discuss um, power because it's the, as, as, um, as the, um, the, psych, the psych team has said, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power imbalance in, in this religious whole thing. And as, as Stephen is saying, if you, if you, it's, it's a form of power that you just need to realize that is there. Let's just discuss power and then uh, I'll, Quest, uh, we will continue. Are you able to read the, the writing? I am almost hugging my screen, so I think I should mute me. Okay, what you know about power? Okay, so... Um, and go back to your your previous audio, the one you started, you, yeah. Um, so, People, just the same way there are different categories of intelligence, there are also different A types and different sources of power. So, you know, the same way you have athletic intelligence, emotional intelligence, physical intelligence, um, various categories, you also have different um, sources of power. Um, so, power is basically gained by the wielding of one's influence and abilities in a space. Any person who has a capacity of using their abilities to solve problems has an amount of power. You, you've, a funny way to put it for me is, you've seen that there's a meme of um, um, ladies in the village um, with um, big pots, those huge pots from back home um, who are serving meat. Okay, and the mean normally says um, during a village functions, these people who had the ultimate power. At that particular moment, they have the they have the power. Um, and so, uh, one brilliant way is to use who is called Hofsted. Um, there's a Dutch there's a Dutch psychologist called Hofsted who was able to show something called power distance. A uh, so power distance is it's, it's, it's an analogy of how do people, how do societies structure and relate to people perceived or real to be within, within power. So there is high distance, there's top up, there's um, flat level. So most of us in um, say Africa, um, Africa, the people in power are perceived to be on top. In Europe, the people in power are seen to be peers. So there's a difference there, but in, it seemingly within most religious organizations, the people within power are placed to be on top. And the reason, the reason like from the African setting, for instance, is historical. <laughs> even before we took up Christianity as a, even before we took Christianity as a form of religion, the Oloi Bons and the Okoyos <laughs> and all those other religious names of our religious leaders had a, had a domain, so there was a chief, but then the religious leaders were um, out on one side and they had the power, they would determine when war can be waged. They were the individuals who cleansed um, returning warriors. And something about that persisted with us even when we received um, Christianity. And so the Okoyot or the Loibon um, was simply um, replaced by the priest or the pastor or the sheikh or the, or the imam, they took that um, position of ultimate authority. And for 
in, in our traditional setting, the, 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 the kind of separation of offices where there was the office of the warrior, the office of the blacksmith, the office of the king, Ruth, the, the, the office of the leader, I mean, of the spiritual leader, kind of helped things to be balanced out, those an interdependence. However, when we've stepped in into religion um, as currently constitution, there's a kind of imbalance. And the biggest imbalance is the inability in many cases for people to speak truth to power. So, and, and this happens in our politics, but also um, happens more within religious setting. At least in politics, the way we tell truth to power is through the vote. Um, when we vote a person out, we're telling them the truth is we didn't like your performance or we don't like you. But in many religious settings, they are such that individuals who have religious power are able to self-perpetuate um, themselves one way or the other. And there are limited avenues to speak truth to the particular power they possess. So to summarize it is, in religion, the source of power is A, the belief in the transcendence, B, the obedience to the transcendent, whether that transcendent is God or whichever name we, we call him, Allah, Murungu, um, Nyasai, Wede Hakaba. So that belief in the transcendent, we often believe that this leader, this leader who has that unique intelligence, that unique ability, has a fairly distinct position with the transcendent. And in many cases, that belief then translates to us engaging with that leader as though we were dealing directly with the transcendent. Um, at times, not even accounting for um, things like that individual's weaknesses, that individual's abilities. And so people at times end up overextending their abilities way and above what they genuinely are able to. And like um, the psychologist said, it is the misalignment, the, the abuse then stems from the sort of misalignment that arises from that. So various perspectives on the question of power. Uh, but but that, that explains the, the top-down um, power, but there's this other power, you know, like the way Steve, uh, Steve said, um, there are CEOs seated in your audience, there are people who actually bought the church, your, uh, your, 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 <clears throat> your, 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 your worshipping in, um, there are people like if you, if you go to the same church as Barack Obama, surely, he has more power than you, and it's, all the other types of the uh, of power, and uh, and 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 I just want us to think about um, religious trauma in terms of you know like the way we in the in the um, in the Christian side we see the horizontal and and the vertical relationship. There's the there's top down from from the religious leaders to us and from from the congregants to the religious leaders and from the congregants to them to to each other. So um, Mukimba, would you want to talk about um, power? And of course, I shall, as usual, throw a curveball to to you. Let me let me just <clears throat> let me. Uh, this is the religious power and control and the cycle of of, of abuse. I know this is the fact because it's me. It's the first time you're seeing this um, from my side, but um, it just it's it's about it's not very well done because I'm not very good at PowerPoint, but. Um, just talk about power and the religious and the cycle of abuse, as in what we go through um, and, and perpetuate in it for eternity in, in terms of religious trauma, if you're able to. Uh, I think I'll attempt. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm seeing this, 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 the cycle is basically the same one as just any other form of experience yes. traumatic yes. experience yeah it's, it's the same and, it's the same yeah it's the same so at, at the end of the day there's coercion i saw at the end there's coercion manipulation whether it's passive or aggressive and it's that middle person or middle people who are between uh like say i said there there's the there's the deity there's whoever it is that we're believing in there's the, that power the absolute power and then there's the human beings in the middle that we've placed above other human beings who most of the times are the ones who are responsible for now the trampling down of the lower person. Now, the who is most of the times like a pyramid, there's more of us over here at the bottom. So when you think about emotional abuse, um, 
But that, that one goes very far. All of that. Because at the end of the day, there's something oh. that we actually believe is good. We were all, like, there's some of us who have been, uh, when you're born, I think it's Kate who's on a, on another meeting. Okay, just go on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, no, I'm sure. Oh, hi, okay. Kate. I'm driving, so I'm not the one talking. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm listening. Okay. All right. Uh, so for for emotional <clears throat> abuse, I think it just goes at such a long range because. A lot of people, a lot of incidences, I feel like that also should be a disclaimer from the beginning of all of this, is that we cannot throw everything into a tiny little neat box and say this is what qualifies as abuse, because I think the effects, the consequences, the losing of faith or, you know, having trauma afterwards, that's what constitutes whether it was, whether it was a traumatic experience for you or not, because some people might mention something like an altar call. If you're in a church where an altar call was not such a big deal, but this happened to you and you were forced to go all the way to the front and you had that experience that really traumatized you, it would be a different situation for somebody else who wasn't. So again, we can tie it into a tiny cute little bow and say that that's where it all starts and ends. But at the end of the day, abuse is abuse. The trauma, is now the consequence, is what that person experiences afterwards. And it comes again from that middle point. The human beings, I feel, are the reason as to why every other form of abuse is not actually performed by an actual deity or anybody else. It's performed by those systems that have been created that have left us in a place where we are not, we are, there's no equality and speaking up like that Steve did say something that I was kind of curious about. The, the, the amount of trauma that the people at the top also carry with them. Because I feel like it can also be cyclic that these people are coming in with trauma and then they're passing along whatever trauma because there's very little training. Honestly, actually very few pastors are, are trained and I'm not so sure about how much training that comes with theological school, but it was good to find out that the chaplain school do a little bit of clinical psychology. That was kind of interesting. I was not aware of that, but there's incompetent people in terms of emotions, in terms of dealing with people, given absolute power. They are given the robe, they are given you know, the collar, and they are empowered to make decisions and that affect a very large amount of people. And that can range from all these things. They're not being able to control the choosing. They're being defined for your identity, whether it's sexuality or it's gender identity, or it's even just basic identity. I've heard, you know, how women have been told in churches how we should behave, how it should be. I think I'll keep going back to the church thing because there's a lot of, you know, reference points there. But I know even in the Islam culture, in the Hindu culture, there's all of that happening that, you know, you're tied down again to a box and you're expected to be that type of person. So it's not even about even your gender, it's even about your personality trait, that that may not be godly, that may not be, and that can leave somebody asking a lot of questions later on in life. So the consequences, I think it's just basically this, the feeling hopeless, the feeling helpless, the depression, anxiety, there are people who are very triggered by the word religion. They're very triggered by the word church. They're very triggered by the word pastor. They're very, very triggered when you say you're Christian or you say you're Islam. They're very, very triggered because they've had some very difficult experiences in spiritual circles. So also there's, there's that gossiping. I think that part comes with a huge, the, the blaming and the minimizing and also the secrecy. I think secrecy, I can't really read everything so clearly, but the secrecy, sometimes that, that happens in a lot. I don't think it's limited to the Catholic church, but it happens a lot. Secrecy of abuse, secrecy of whatever is going on inside that system. Let's not take it out. Let's not report it to the authorities. Yeah. 
So I, I hope I've done an averagely good job <laughs> explaining. <laughs> You've done a very good job. Kate, Kate, okay, Kate, now are you able to comment? <clears throat> Um, I actually, you've really done so well because it's like you're reading my mind. Whatever oh, okay. you're talking about is what has been. Can you hear me? Yes, we um, can. She has actually touched a lot on the various things. I like what you said. An abuse is kind of particular. You cannot, what I term as an abuse to me or of offending to me may not be offending to someone else. So it's good the way you actually said it. And something else that you actually said that I really wanted to point out is when it comes to our churches and power, the person, the, the churches and also other religious, other religion, they have actually chosen certain people who carry, who have power <clears throat> to actually make certain decisions. Like you said, it's not only, we, we keep on touching on the pastor, but I also feel in the Christian world, there are these um, leaders, the elders, they're called the elders, I think. They are men elders and they're women elders. I think apart from the pastor, we should also touch on them because they also carry an, a certain amount of power that actually can actually uh, have some consequences or lead trauma to certain um, type of congregants. Because as we, an example of the will, let me just use it, under the emotional abuse, the name calling. Most of the name calling, actually you may not find your pastor calling you name, but actually you'll find that the, the if you're a woman, let's just say in some churches, there are big things that they have actually put down. Like the way she said, there's a way you're supposed to dress, there's a way you're supposed to act. So if you don't act according to their uh, supposed ways of doing things, you will be called a sinner. Because when it when we we are talking about churches, and you know, uh, in a Christian, in Christians we can have the Catholic and Protestants. So and also Protestants we have various um, various sects. Uh, but um, but all in all, you'll get that the women, if you do against what they have actually said, they will term you as a sinner. You'll even we told you're going to go to hell and various things. So we must also expound on, not only concentrating on the past, as you say, but there are those people whom the churches also have granted power. Those people who maybe uh, have, they do a lot in the church. And so they, you find that for the church to make any decision or to do whatever, they're even given those that much power. So as, we, as much as we address all that, I do agree with you. We should just, you cannot actually pinpoint that this is the cause of abuse and this is the abuse, this is not abuse. Each and every different person can go to different, can get actually different type of abuse and it can be caused by the di different um, people that are going to the different religion and whatever power that they have. Okay. In, in, in uh, my own church and the church, yes. yeah, the three of us, by the way, um, the biggest payout um, in terms of insurance is for sexual abuse. And this is the Seventh-day Adventist church. So it's, um, it's just not spoken about out there, but the biggest payout of the Seventh-day Adventist church is sexual abuse. And it starts as, as um, just like any other thing, it's part of religious trauma and part of, of other, uh, other traumas. So it's just not the Catholic church. We need to speak about these things. And I'm going to go to Stephen to comment on the train of thought we've had, the power, and especially for, for you pastors who may be, who are usually poorer than many of the con congregants, um, just talk about the, the, that kind of power and the cycle of abuse that you also receive from from the congregants and your uh, and the leaders who are on top of you. Like um, in the in the like in the hierarchy of the Adventist Church, we we'll use the Adventist Church because we have a different structure. Um, what's the 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 kind of trauma you 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 receive from the your superiors from the general conference and all that stuff, and anything else? <clears throat> and the wheel the, is this wheel better now? I know it's not as detailed, but it fits the screen. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Steve. Okay, um, you, know, you mentioned a lot of things there. I what? know, I'm sorry. It's my <laughs> adult ADHD. No, it, it's fine. 
yeah um i think the the topic you've touched on is is very concerning um to begin with um uh you know sometimes we hear about hush money you know um being paid out uh by corporates and uh, uh <laughs> it, it rarely do you hear about uh these things happening in churches and churches going to court and having to pay out big sums because of this abuse but but i think that's the evidence that we have that we 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 cannot uh controvert the fact that there's abuse going on you know uh in different areas and maybe this is just sexual abuse you're talking about and it's costing a lot of money and do the people who give that money even know that um that 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 that's where some of the money keeps going so every worship day people will be asked to give but um are they given a report of um <laughs> of how the money was spent and how much went where i'm sure the reports will probably be printed if it's not really ed edited or um or presented with such technical terms that you cannot even identify what that line item really was so but members in essence members never really get to understand you know where sometimes some of this money went to and it's not just and i'm glad you've raised this so we can we can we can see it's not just an isolated case many of us probably know the issues that the, the catholic church the roman catholic church has had they've um I think there's there's sections of the Roman Catholic Church that have had to file for bankruptcy just because of uh, <laughs> litigation, you know, on sexual abuse cases. Um, so this is going on in many, many other places. But um, I'm glad that conversations like this are beginning to happen. And for me to see a conversation like this beginning to happen uh, in, in, in an environment or a society that that largely you would not even be open to speaking about things like this is, is a ray of hope that uh, times are changing. And, uh, and not just uh, members, but I guess the leaders, all the leaders that even Kate has said, uh, beginning with elders, um, for us as pastors, you know, the administrators need to listen. And so for me, I think, for this session, it will, be, it will be more of me listening than even than even speaking. And I was, while I was preparing for this, I was actually wondering, um, are we going to have more of, you know, even hearing stories from some of the people that are here on board and watching? I don't know if that's possible. It might be hard because we don't know what can come on board. This can take off on a very unexpected tangent. But the fact is, there's been there's been there's been abuse. So, um, yeah. So that, that hierarchy that we have of power uh, creates a problem. Um, it creates fights. Um, you've, got, you've got a lot of money at a certain level and very little money at other levels. But most of that money is coming from a level where it's not accessible again. So you've got local churches, for instance, that give all this offering and send it all the way up this um, administrative structure and they're struggling let's say for instance to put together a church and members have to struggle until they've constructed that church and then uh, administration would come and dedicate and take possession of all the documentation the and everything for me um for me i feel this is an area that should be and I, i'm choosing my words carefully here because um, we all know, you know, the kind of consequences that sometimes I've faced a lot of this from my study in ministry up to now, like you get earmarked, <clears throat> uh, you get, you get punished, you know, for even saying some things. But if this is a lot of Africans being here talking about stuff like this, then I don't, I don't think people can avoid uh, the fact that questions are being raised. So yeah, you have a lot of financial abuse. Uh, going on not just sexual abuse there's financial abuse there's emotional abuse there's all that um so i i don't know how much more i can say but yeah uh, i know I, I put you on a spot and i know our our see we need to talk about it i know i know 
your yeah for you I, I appreciate and for the rest of us who are not employed by the general conference and people like here we can open our mouths um and and i'm i'm just glad that you um listening but let's let me shift this a bit well, well let me say this i'm not <laughs> I'm, I'm not also employed by the yeah. by the church officially I'm, I'm just trying to respect you know um the yeah. fact that um there's um the things we are talking about are real the things yeah. we're talking about are real you know and i want you to even see it from my own position as yeah. As someone who has experienced uh, a lot of backlash, a lot of even financial abuse, like you get ostracized, put away from the system, so to speak, just because you're trying to speak or say some of these things that will come up at some point. So um, it's not just members, it's not just church members who are struggling with this. Sometimes even have pastors or ministers who, um, who suffer a lot, who will actually suffer a lot just because um, you tend to seem like you're going against the grain, <laughs> you're not towing the line. Um, so you can suffer a lot of consequences. Um, and, and yeah, we need to have these conversations. Uh, so yeah, these things are real. They're very, very, very real. Um, suicide rates uh, among pastors okay. is something very concerning because, yeah. you know, religious trauma around these circles is is something serious yeah. so you get people having burnout having um no way to get help nowhere you can speak nobody to turn to and so very sadly you have even ministers taking their own lives you can imagine how much harm now that does again to uh, the congregations so yeah <clears throat> My, my heart goes out uh, out to you, um, shepherds of 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 God's word, as as in it's it's tough. Um, I've seen it, and I would never want to be in your shoes, never. Uh, and my heart goes out to you, and I hope we talk about this more so that uh, people can come out and we can right the wrong. We can make the situation better for future uh, religious leader of if, for any denomination. And uh, I just want us to shift a bit because you know we can be here till the uh, cows get home. I just want us to discuss. And my slides are not organized because I, I put anything I think about on the slide. So this is uh, we are going to discuss um, our religious texts. So Xerox that slide. Context minus text is, is um, the con, and I want us to tie it in with this slide. And um, excess, just give me, leave me alone. <laughs> and um, and this slide. So the um, so we 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 are we we are going to touch um on on the scriptures and um and I want us to talk about taking religious uh, texts out of context. Mm -hmm. Um, talking about um religious milestones, like um how how you deal with an um the real. Uh, the, the people who can be, be abused and yet they are just new to the fold visa versus you Steve or Sire who've been in this uh, immersed in the world in the in the in the in the world for so long and uh, the amount of scripture reading we are we are doing so Sire because you translate my the Luya and Sheng in my head to words to start and you can tell me which slide you want to go, me to go on plus this this okay let me just go back look at the education um uh, and this is a, a research done in the in the us i don't think we have this research in the, in uh, in my in my Eshibinga village in 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 um in western kenya but uh, this is the um education levels of of the various religious groups and as expected um uh, look at the Jehovah Witnesses versus their other people. So let's, Sire, my Luya English, Sheng, just start. So, um, so I'll just take one step back. I think so far the way the convo has gone is um, we, 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 we are looking at trauma and I think so far the first source we have discussed is power imbalance and it has very many um, dimensions to it. So it's um, religious leaders, whether it's the pastors, the elders, 
are misusing um, that power or it is church members abusing the power they have towards religious leaders. So it makes them the communities of faith become cross abusive spaces. And then what you're doing now, just trying to interpret your thought, is going to the next um, vulnerability spots um, that would expose individuals to abuse. And <clears throat> from the series of slides you're showing, is there seems to be there for a correlation between scripture, um, what is it called? People reading scripture and understanding it, the education level of the people reading, which is something about exposure. Um, and I agree at, 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 at certain, at, 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 at what is it called, at multiple levels. So number one is the, the whether it's the power structure or the discipline structures or the organization structure, whichever religious dispensation you look at, they borrow that authority by from some text, some religious text, whether it's the Gita or the Quran or the Bible. They, 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 they get that from, from the text. And the risk of abuse, which therefore leads to trauma, is higher in a case where either A, the leaders do more reading and the members or the followers um, do not do the reading. Case in point is what in <clears throat> Christian history we call the dark ages, where the reading of the Bible became the preserve of the priests. And so the people, the word comes better in Swahili, the people got what in Swahili we call mapokezi. They, they, they got basically the, the interpretation and that opened the church to a period of a bit of st uh, out astounding um, abuses during the, the, the session called the period um, called the Dark Ages. But also, um, so, so scripture reading, if, if individuals are not reading their own text, then they become susceptible to being abused because then they are left at the whims of whichever other person interprets or how they interpret it. But then all the scriptures, all the religious texts, um, whether it's the Gita, the Quran, the Bible, um, are written in old languages, but most of these faith propositions have gone into areas wider than the initially the recipients. So Christianity begins mostly around Palestine, but now is actually more prominent in say, South America and Africa. Therefore, a level of education becomes a very important thing. And again, at two levels, level number one is, hey, how am I meant to understand a text that was written in an old language in some old setting, and I'm not very well educated? It, it, these are, these are, there are certain limitations and certain um, misinterpretations that happen when your education level is not all right. Um, it's, it's the same reason we take people to school to learn architecture even if they may be gifted builders, because then it helps you harness your skill. But then secondly, there's no way you can, for you to interpret, you need to understand. And therefore education levels of the members becomes an important thing. It includes things like critical thinking. If, um, if your congregation is only filled with people who are semi-educated or illiterate, it becomes, it becomes way easier for you to tell them whatever you want to tell them. But if your congregate, congregants are well-educated individuals, there's a lot of critical thinking, there's a lot of pushback, there's a lot of questioning and, and deep questions. And so you'll tend to find in um, religious organizations that tap into people who are better educated, the exchange culture is better as opposed to religious organizations that tap into individuals who are not very then well educated. However, with both the scripture and education is another source or center of power, which again, if not properly handled, can become a source of abuse. Case in point is Steve um, getting into, this is just an example, Steve getting onto the pulpit and beginning to tell us in the Greek, it says this, or in the Hebrew, it says this, and hey, 99% of us have never seen a Hebrew, a Hebrew text. And if Steve wants to advance 
his own agenda, or Steve is already feeling threatened. Maybe he, he just has a bachelor's and his congregants are Professor so-and-so, Dr. so-and-so. He may then over leverage this ability of Hebrew and Greek to either mislead or to make up or, or cover up um, whichever thing um, they need to. Equally, education then becomes a two-way source of um, abuse within faith circles where members can then look down on their um, leaders, whether it's your elder or your deaconess or um, mama guild or whichever, or your pastor, because they're not as educated as you are. And in, in retaliation, they may want to then now use the power of the office to try and put there. So all those dynamics begin ha happening. A, a final perspective to it is not always, but most of the times where you have occults, where people um, tend to gravitate around, mostly around a charismatic leader, two, in, two things that bring about, and, and cults are genius at producing religious trauma, whether it's excesses or all the way to death, but two indicators of places where cults generally come up is one, people who either misread underread or misquote whichever scripture or text they get. And then two is individuals whose education level is, who are not very well educated, tend, I'm not saying it's the only cause, but tend to become more easily persuadable to um, follow um, what we traditionally call occults. Of course, there are cases where well-read people, well-exposed people still become occult, um, still lean to the occult, but the tendency is higher in this um, regard. I think interpreting your previous slides for that would be the way I keep joining what we are doing and what we are continuing. Okay, and this is free for all. I do not know who wants to uh, follow up on what is my gibberish or what Sire eloquently put out. Uh, does anyone, any uh, from the from the pulpit team, that is Steve, and from the psych team, Mukimba and Kate, does anyone have a, does anyone have anything to add on to that? Uh, for me, I think the the education levels is uh, is something critical. Um, uh, I have had uh, uh, I think the 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 slide you showed that was showing different denominations or religious groups and educational levels, I think was quite concerning. One of those that you showed that had, had a pretty high um, rate of uh, uh, membership that had, uh, I think, high school education. Um, I've had a bit of an interaction in recent times and I was quite baffled with uh, um, the level of control and uh, that's, that's going on in there. Uh, it's not this is not unique to just this one denomination it happens everywhere but it's characteristic of of how abuse happens you know where you find that even education sometimes is uh, discouraged that oh uh, <laughs> this 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 will lead you astray and stuff so um there was a case in point where you know simple things like even appreciating birthdays you know are People find scriptural, and this I'll tie this in with misreading uh, scripture and misusing scripture. People tie in, you know, scripture into, you know, condemning the one way that human beings know of how to appreciate life. You know, so you ask yourself um, when you when when certain groups, for instance, are uh, becoming heavy on okay, taking an issue with celebrating birthdays and quoting scripture for that matter. Um, they might be having reasons to do that, but when you critically think about it, okay, these are human beings. The best thing they have, the best gift human beings have is life, okay? You say your Bible says God gave them life. So why would the God who gave people life turn around and condemn human beings for appreciating the one best thing that he actually gave them in the one and only way they know how to do? which is remembering the day you were born, you know? So just because one or two people uh, abused, you know, uh, this 
wonderful things that human beings throughout the ages have recognized. Uh, just one or two people and they're put there in the scripture. You use that and magnify it, create a macro issue out of a micro issue, you know, um, and maybe a whole other doctrine. Uh, and you have significant consequences. So I had a case in point where, you know, we're trying to help someone process her American passport and she can't even put down her mother's birthday. Why? Because we don't recognize birthdays. And I'm like, seriously, you know, um, this, this is abuse, you know, this is, this is insane. And that's the level to which sometimes, you know, um, sad to say, um, religion can take people where you can be denied, not just, you can be denied of huge privileges in life, just out of a very simple thing, a very simple, you can, you can see a very simple doctrine, but that turns out to even denying you something like American citizenship, maybe for your folk or someone, just because of a certain belief that you have. It's very, very disturbing, very, very concerning. And you see the trends of um, trying to clamp down on any attempts to get more and more educated so that you can keep control. So people, people in leadership can keep control of the flock and still have them, you know, toe the line in some way. So, um, yeah, I'd say ed education is liberating in, in some way. Um, <clears throat> and the more people get educated, the better, I guess, the better, because we can talk about some of these things. I had a church member that, uh, and I love this church member. I mean, he left church. He's, he's an atheist right now. But some of the most rewarding conversations I've had, even for me spiritually, have been with this fellow. He was a very intelligent fellow, and he asks very difficult questions. But for me, I don't think he actually left the faith. I think he just did not find people that he could talk with at the same level. So he just had to find somewhere to go. You know, he just had to find somewhere to go. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I think we need to have the church needs to be a little more tolerant to opposing voices or different views. Like this guy, for instance, he. He wanted to be there to help uh, the church in other ways. For instance, PA system. He doesn't believe in the faith, bring, still brings his family. He appreciated the community. So he has left what he calls the faith, but he still recognizes the fact that this church is where my social circle is. This is where my friends are. This is where my family is. So I'll still show up. I'll still be there. I'll still help. But is the, is the church going to reciprocate you know the same like actually still give him the same measure of acceptance though he is of a different differing opinion more often than not that doesn't happen and that's that's quite sad but when you look at the christian text let's say for instance it speaks to love it speaks to tolerance but sometimes we don't see a lot of this happening which still boils down to misuse of the same scriptures that uh, that that we're supposed to uphold. Okay, and, and, and in terms of, um, of the Christian faith and, uh, and scripture and, and, um, and all that, is it that it's too holy? It's be, even we are not talking the normal way we would talk because part of it is, uh, is ingrained in us that it was untouchable. I, um, let me illustrate with an example. My, part of my school in this trauma is I like beds made, right? But my children, of course, because their teenager do not want to make their bed. So what I would do is, because it would annoy me, I would make like my daughter's bed and make sure that the uh, room was neat until one day she told me when I do that, she cannot touch it because it's too perfect. Mm. Have we presented faith that way to people that it's too perfect uh, to touch and how do we reconcile? Was it always that way? Like um, when we were worshiping, uh, when my great grandfather Limera was worshiping Nyasai um, Were Hakava, was he untouchable? Have we presented to people religion that is untouchable and and as such perpetuated all this um, all this trauma, all these bad things because of that? Uh, Mukimba and Kate, you can. Uh, 
uh, take a stab at that? Um, uh, there are certain things that I've actually jotted down while Pastor Bund was talking. Okay. Um, there's something when you're talking about, I'll answer your question uh, about education. We said it's a two way source of abuse. I do agree with that. And uh, about the church not being a safe place, it's true. We find that we say the church was supposed to, or a place of worship, let me just say a place of worship, is supposed to be a place, a safe haven or a healing place. But you find that with time, there are people who have not had an opportunity of getting a healing space or welcomed or feel at home where they are. And uh, we said something about tolerance, patience, and love. It's true. When you think about the place of worship, you want to feel that there, there is that patience that they have or tolerance towards you, not, not judge. Like you don't want to feel judged. You want to feel wel welcome. When you talk about the higher being, you feel like you're supposed to be taken as you are and it helps you to feel, to fit into that place as the way you are. But that's not it. As you have seen with the boy that wanted to be in charge because the friends were in charge but didn't feel like he fitted in. The other thing that we say that I wanted to say something that has actually realized when Pastor Udo was talking is there is projection of beliefs in charge. Like there is what, and as this goes back to the power. The people that have the power in churches, there are certain beliefs that they have. So I feel from what we are talking about, there are people in churches who try to project those beliefs on other people, whether they understand it or not. If uh, according to the hierarchy of power in churches, if I read the scripture and this is what it is, I have interpreted it. What I'm understanding is, in a way, the, the way I believe it is the way that I really want the congregants mm -hmm. to take it. If they don't actually understand it in that way, that it doesn't fall into the norm. And when you talk about reading the scriptures and how we interpret it, in essence, I'm saying that the churches, there are people, or you say those people in power who are abusing that um they're, they're busy in the point that that they are weaponizing the scriptures weaponizing. like if you do something they will tell you uh, uh according to the scriptures you are not supposed to do one to them uh, because as i and they will quote for you the, the scriptures so that to me i feel like we are weaponizing it yes to go back to what you're saying it's true as i said a place of worship should be a safe haven should be taken the way we are and how God created us. Because just as our five fingers are, we are not going to be the same in the church. We have the very rich, we have the very poor, we have the very highly educated, and we have those who are not being privileged to have high education. We are different in you. But I believe a place um, of worship is one place where we, feel we all should feel equal. So if that's not in place, just as you're saying, you used to make your daughters. Um, a bed when <laughs> yeah and she was like i can't touch it because mom made it and it looks so perfect you've given a very nice example so in charge if you don't do something you're going to feel like eh, i can't even am i can't even do it because it's not the standard am i it's a of what am i charge or what have been brought up to believe in terms of religion have i answered you i hope so yes you have um Okay, because I, I want us to 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 shift to two groups of people that, that I feel like we need to just address them on their own. Um, um, unless someone wants to one, Dennis, I see your hand. Unless you're gonna talk for thirty seconds, mm, to to onge. Um, yeah. So Dennis, do you want to go ahead for one forty five seconds? Go ahead. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you can mention something if Dennis is not ready. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead. Then, then uh, before you go ahead, let me just uh, so that you prepare in your mind. I, I want us to talk about pastors' kids or PKs, pastors' wives, um, and the LGBTQ community, and uh, and how we've treated and or mistreated them, and how we've pushed them out of church, and the trauma that. Um, Oh, and the fourth group, the vicarious trauma. And I, uh, um, I, I, let me give, uh, let me, for the vicarious trauma, let me give an example of, uh, we, 
who watch stuff uh, on 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 YouTube were affected when Ravi Zacharias, and I think most Christians know, was outed as being sexually abusive in his death, and it affected very many Christians. And all his YouTube videos, but they have been pulled down. And I felt, even me who never feels things for people, I felt like hurt. Um, and that's the vicarious trauma. So that those those are the things we are gonna close with, but. Yeah, go ahead and then we'll address the PKs in uh, SDA lingo, the shepherdesses, I hate that word, but shepherdesses, and then the, the LGBTQ, and then vicarious trauma. Tuta funga hapo, lakini go ahead. Well, so back to the issue of perfection, you know, uh, making your daughter's bed and she's like, man, I, I, can't, I can't touch this. Uh, that's a real issue because, um, just like someone mentioned, and this can, can even make some people angry, you know, uh, when we're talking about the emotional abuse and the name calling, you know, some, you know, we have a lot of this sometimes going on in church, but, but when you, when you critically look at, at, at just the Bible story, sometimes you wonder why we emphasize some things. Okay. <clears throat> Granted, there's, there's talk of sinners and that's, that's fine. But drumming in the fact that you are sinners, you are sinners, you are sinners, you are unworthy, you know, um, we can make it, you know. Um, there's a sense of shaming that, that goes with that. Uh, so you have, you have it drummed into people that who they are as human beings is really not worth it, you know. So people start craving for something else that's otherworldly and never appreciating who they are in person as people, never appreciating this world. So we talk about ourselves being corrupted with sin. We talk about this world being corrupted with sin. We talk about more of getting another body, you know? And so we, we tend to think there's nothing much of value about this body. We talk about heaven and we don't get to really appreciate this world for what it is and immersing ourselves into this world <clears throat> and offering what we can offer to this world. Why? Because we are otherworldly minded, you know, so much. And uh, like, so we've shamed ourselves, we've shamed our world. But when you look at the Bible, it's a whole different story. The whole Emmanuel concept, it, it's talking about God leaving everything, leaving the fact that he is God. What, what much better can you want to be than being like God? But God is laying that aside. That's the story of the scripture and choosing to become a human being with a body like ours, saying you're fearfully and wonderfully made, walking like us, eating like us, crying like us. You know, why would we be, why would we want to shame, you know, human beings for who they are, ourselves for who they are? Read the whole story in the Bible. How does the story end, you know, in, in Revelation? It talks about uh, God himself saying, you know, the tabernacle of God being with men, the dwelling place of God being with men. Like this earth is the place God wants to come. And I'm sorry, I'm beginning to sound like I'm preaching. <laughs> yes. but, 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 but it's, you know, it's, it's disturbing. I just have to say it's disturbing. You can't, you can't even find, you can't find a place to tell people things like this, even in the church. It's crazy, you know, that being human is something beautiful. Having a body like this is something beautiful. If God can take up a body like this and be cool to have a body like this, that's the story of the Bible, and be cool to take a body like this with him to heaven and have a body, the Bible says there's a man, you know, in heaven who, somebody who looks just like you and me, doesn't look like angels. Why would we be so ashamed of ourselves? So this name calling, this unworthiness, this stuff makes us lose so much in this life and also not offer much in this life. So the church becomes very, very irrelevant in, in, many, in many aspects of life because of some issues, um, some issues like this. So when we are talking about perfection, you know, um, wanting to be all that and not appreciating who we are in our, you know, with our struggles, with our issues. It's a problem because we see 
even even within the Christian scriptures, we see a God who doesn't even come to fix things, but immerses himself in our situation and lives in our situation, you know, just like us. And so we can let human beings understand that it's a beautiful life, you know, it's a beautiful body you've got, you know, it's, it's a beautiful world out here. Let's step into the world. Let's try to make it something. Let's try to make it a little better for ourselves. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the whole question of perfection sometimes is very discouraging because, um, and, and I saw this in going through theology school where we had two camps of lecturers. One was a camp that would be called a conservative one, which, which seemed more the perfectionist style, you know, everything perfect, dressed up in suits and ties and whatnot and very holy and stuff. And the other one was what they would call the liberal. And these guys would dress in shorts and come to watch, these are professors would come to watch uh, football matches with students. And, you know, they would play with the rest of us. They would tell us about their stories of failure. Now, I, I noticed that a lot of the students gravitated to the imperfect, the so-called imperfect ones. Why? Because they spoke to their situation. These are the struggles everybody was having. So if I know Professor so-and-so uh, had this kind of struggle when he was a kid or even as an adult, and I'm having that kind of struggle, then I am likely to go to him and say, hey, um, I'm struggling with this. Can we talk about it? And the, this guy's had a real ministry going on. But guess what? They knew they would not last in the system. Many of them got fired, you know? They, they got fired, but they had done their work. There's so much power in just being real with ourselves, with what we are going through. And I think that's a kind of situation that we need in, 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 religious, in religious circles. Um, so- Okay, now that you've said that, my gosh. So again, a good example. We know Prince Andrew screwed up royally, right? But you can see that the-, that the the house of Windsor threw him out. Like they said, I feel like the church does that. Like they, they want to preserve the monarchy or, the, or the, the, the way it is and throws out anyone else. They don't care about the consequences because the giving Prince Andrew as the example, his children, his uh, grandchildren, we don't know what's gonna happen to them, but because he screwed up and uh, soiled the good name of the monarchy, he was thrown out. And I think we do that um, in the church. Okay, that's just me thinking, but can, um, let's, let's discuss the, the, the groups of people, the PKs, the sh shepherdesses, and then the LGBTQ, and then we can talk about the curious trauma. And any, um, Saya, do you want to start? I, I actually want to start. I'm yeah. actually asking at what point do we talk of. Um, I'll remove your. Go back to your nice audio. I want to start off. I'm actually asking like, is there a path or a plan to talk about <clears throat> dealing and addressing and healing from religious trauma? Because, um, yeah, just, just bring that up. But no, I'd really like to hear, especially the ladies on the call, giving a stab about some of the things you've said. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let, let's let's lay out the problems, then we'll we'll heal them, right? Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about the pastors' kids. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I think something I noticed, even in just generally in my own practice, is most of the people who actually have a lot of dislike and hate towards church are people who either, maybe not necessarily only pastors' kids, but there were kids whose parents were like seriously staunch, born again Christians. I'm gonna use the Christian aspect over here. And there were people who their parents were in a really like, we talked about the hierarchy and they were at the top and there were the people who, you know, were well-known in church and all that stuff. But then their behavior back at home just never reflected what their experience was in church yeah they were coercive they were manipulative there were all these other things back at home and for 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 people who've gone through this when 
you've been born into a faith. You didn't have, most, most people who are born into faith do not get that chance to choose. And until they're adults, they have to stick around in this situation and they have to just sit in it for a long period of time, even when they don't agree with it. And then questions are not answered. And then behavior is very questionable. And that dissonance, we talked about it during the adverse childhood experiences, the dissonance, the difference between how I'm feeling and what is being told to me. I'm being told that God is love, but yet I'm told that I am so shameful to, to have this whole experience. And if he loves me, why does it feel so horrible? If this is love, why is it such an ugly feeling afterwards? But to understand the dynamic of, you know, cults and cult-like living in religious practices, it's, it's coming from a place where we have to disempower people and that has to come with that shame. And so for pastors, kids, and all those people, they get to see these things straight, you know, because you, you can only be a hypocrite for so long. At the altar, you're very good and, you know, you have the right words to say, and you have all those things and you're telling people that they're sinners and they're all these things. But as soon as you get to the house, there's a completely different person at the, in, the, in the homestead. And that's the person who is abusive to his children or to her children. Or that's the person who is, you know, who hits his wife. That's the person who is unfaithful to his wife. And yet you're being preached to something completely different. So these people, they tend to get to a place where they question everything and they have to take away all their beliefs because you don't even know which one to take, which one to retain and which one to take, to, to take away because you've been manipulated all through your childhood. But Saya was asking about the healing and I wanted to use just a personal experience. My own personal experience when it came to church was, honestly, I didn't like church for a very long period of time. As soon as I was able to say I didn't have to go to church, I was not interested into going into the physical place that was church. And for a long time, I had to come up with that, my own definition of what I wanted religion to mean to me. And I had to have my own personal relationship with God and it needed to be something I didn't inherit from somebody else. It wasn't something that somebody fed me. It needed to be me reading the scripture myself. And that should be something that should be encouraged. Yeah, people should be encouraged to find out what it is, even question, like the questioning I feel is perfectly okay, that people have questions, children have questions. Why is Jesus like this? If this is what he says, we need to be able to answer those questions to give people the freedom to ask and answer those questions, or even seek for themselves those answers so that when they do make that decision, Religion shouldn't be something that people should inherit because as long as it's inherited, you inherit it together with my own trauma experience, my own bias, my own, I'm looking for, you know, scripture that suits whatever it is that I want to speak to you at that moment. If I want you to be quiet as a child, I'll tell you, you know, blessed are the meek or something like that, you know, I'll use whatever suits the emotion that I'm feeling at that moment. when. I am angry and something like that, I will support it with scripture because you can always find some scripture somewhere that makes whatever it is that you're doing right. And when the people in power do it, it's okay. It's, it's a mistake. It's something that can be corrected. But when the people at the bottom do it, the ones who've been disempowered, which, who is most of the times children and members of the congregation, when them at the bottom, when them they do a mistake, then they're labeled. So finding out what religion means to you, I feel like it's something every single religion should allow, like a Ram Springer or whatever it is that, um, what are they called? Um, it's not Hasidic Jews, uh, they're the ones. So the ones that live in the middle of nowhere, uh, I've forgotten, but there's, there's, there's a certain type of, um, they allow their young people to go out into the world find out what that is for them, if this is actually something they want to commit themselves to for the rest of their lives. I think that would be a great place for healing so that people don't come in with all this baggage <clears throat> and you know they feel like they were force fed something. 
But then there was also something key that I noted um, in terms of why people are very prime to abuse and religious abuse. And I noticed poverty is a really big part, especially Kenyan religion. We, pro we promise wealth a lot. That is an answer to especially very Protestant type of thinking. Uh, if God is for you, then there's a lot of wealth coming your way. So obviously for, for people who don't have that, it's a very, it's, it's very alluring. So poverty, lack of education, and something very important that we should touch on or okay, should also come in at a point like this is pre-existing trauma. If you have your own trauma, it's very easy for you to be susceptible. You could be well-educated, you could even have money, but if you have been primed for this whole abuse, it's very easy for you to get into a cult-like thinking, get into that community because you desperately need it. You need that place to belong and it's very easy for that to be abused. So poverty, the lack of education, and I also being pre pre-existing trauma makes you very, very prime for abuse. Okay, and, and, and anyone who's following up um, after Mukimba, would you also um, address the terms of endearment, the calling people, other people who are not your father, daddy and mommy? I know people I'm gonna, are gonna pray for me this week, but pray for me. Um, the, the sharing of terms of endearment, um, spiritual father, spiritual. I know for, for the Adventist movement, this is not for us, but I know someone who that was a big deal. She's a PK and sharing the name Baba Mama with someone with the whole congregation for her was, was not good. I don't know. Um, anyone who's following up after Mukimba can address that. Kate, I, because I cannot see you. Talk <clears throat> oh, About that mom and dad, I think Pastor Bundy should address it <laughs> if he doesn't mind. But on what we are talking about, the um, pastors, his and wife, uh, what I think is when your father or your mother is a pastor, there's a way the church expects you to carry yourself. So fast, when you're going these, by just mutually being a child or um, spouse to pastor, there's a way the church expects you to work, even the congregation. There's a way they expect you to walk, dress and everything. So that means you have to change your way of life because, and you also believe. So to me, when you say we should address the kids and the wives, I think that's the major thing that the, the congregation tends to want to dictate how the wife and the children should behave and what should, they should do. About the lesbians, the bisexual and gay, it's the churches have actually put them like outskirts because they don't understand it and it's not supported. As we say, the scriptures, the way we are saying, the way you interpret the scriptures and how you try and teach your congregation really, really, really matters. Because you'll find there are some churches here that have actually embraced the children, like let me just say the congregants who are not within the norm like they have fallen, they are sexually attracted to male counterparts or they're sexually the same, the same gender. They have actually embraced them, but there are some churches that are using the scriptures not to embrace them. Actually, they will call you, them they have actually suffered the, the name, names calling. Yesterday I was talking to a friend, she's a human activist. I was hoping she's going to actually attend this podcast, but I think she's caught, she's caught up with something. And she told me, that this days you're not supposed to say she, he, you say they. There's a way you're supposed to say they. And if you just actually, she was trying to teach me in the various uh, aspects, I was not getting it. It's actually very quite hard for me, let me not lie. So you tend, this, we have generational issues, as um, the psychologists were saying, we have generational issues. And they tend to trickle down. So there's this generation. Uh, if you try and explain to them that the, the, the call your mom, dad, I am falling in love, or I feel this, this, they cannot understand it. In fact, they will say you are possessed. Actually, so they can even take you to church. And they will try and actually have people pray for you. I understand in the Muslim culture, I've had two patients where if they had a mental problem, you know how they solved it is you sit in the middle 
to sit in a small stool and they call the religious um, uh, men to come actually and quote, they actually read through the Quran. They read, they read, and they believe that they actually are possessed, so they are trying to actually correct you by reading. You see, by doing that, they are not caught, they are not dealing with the issue. So they are not, they're not going to feel like you're fitting or your problem has been solved. As we let, let me let Pastor Bundi address the issue of mom and dad, and then we can continue. I hope okay. I've helped you on the aspect of the pastor's kids. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, you have. And um, any question for sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just piggybacking on the, on the, on the Islamic culture and mental health issues. I know, like, um, the Somali community in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, is having a, a drug issue, as well as the rest of East, the Eastern African communities having a, a substance abuse problem. And when people die from substance abuse, they'd rather say the person died from a heart attack. I know cocaine can cause heart attacks, but no one is accepting that part. And part of it is all these traumas. You can imagine uh, Somali refugees, nobody has ever addressed their trauma in a way that the community can under, understand it. And then coming into this country and with a president who really said they should go back home. It's been, it's heat after heat after heat. Then you add also the um, religious trauma on top of them. Sometimes you just sit down and weep for our people. Um, Steve, <clears throat> do your uh, congregants call you dad and mom and how do you, I know it's not an Adventist issue, but just um, address it. And anything else we have said, uh, PKs uh, like because you 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 have PKs now and your shepherdess. I'm gonna hit that shepherdess wife. Um, how do you how do you deal with that? Because they 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 it's not their baggage, but they uh, they they carry it, and also um, they also suffer from you know the other power that's within the church, and many shepherdesses are not educated also. So just it's. It's a lot, but just to address and any hope uh, um, because Sarah wants us to talk about hope. Uh, for just and I'm keeping my eye on the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Keep bringing, on the time. Um, one other source of thing that um, is being requested is uh, be, be, um, the, the the power of you know where now pastors begin running. Or, or sheikhs or priests begin running everything. They run hospitals, they run uh, schools, they run everything and they run basically everyone out of town or they run the things to the ground. If that form of trauma, which um, and the financial side of it, which therefore people are, uh, people then um, are talking about, a, you need to address a, such management or mismanagement, which then is often accompanied with people being bullied to give money or arm twisted to give money um, to manage institutions. And then the other form of trauma being considered online here is the trauma arising from church politics. If anyone can be able like, whether it's electoral cycles or people positioning themselves for power and everything. I will let, I will let our father, Stephen, Papa Stephen <laughs> to address this and any other person Hey, Steve, Steve, we are so sorry. Next time we look for, I tried to look for an imam. I tried. <laughs> I really tried. Yeah. Well, well, I, I just wish we had a lot more time or maybe a series of days to do this because there's so many issues to talk about. And this, these are issues that are close to the heart of people, you know, and Sadly, uh, as you can tell from even the, the, the number of people we have on board today, <laughs> this, this is something that, that, that is close to the heart of this, of everyone. So I'm glad you addressed this. Anyway, <clears throat> make sure of daddy, mommy, I would personally be very uncomfortable if, <laughs> if I'm leading a congregation and they start calling me daddy or my wife, mommy, or, you know, I... It's, it's just a natural thing to do. I, I just can't fathom how, you know, um, people would uh, get to the point where that's kind of normalized, you know. Uh, but with all due respect to how sometimes this is done, I think 
it boils down to an issue of that's acceptable, which is mentorship or maybe even discipleship or something like that. I think it is okay to, um, when you aspire for something, if you can find someone who has walked that journey and kind of have them help you along that journey, it's a wise thing to do. And I think it's acceptable. It's what people do in terms of mentorship and stuff, you know, in every, in every circle of life. Um, that's what parenting is all about. Uh, so I, I think the issue is not really about the names that are used, but what's going on over here. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but, but if the names create an issue of, that has to do with boundaries and stuff, then maybe that can be addressed without losing sight of the fact that, okay, we have a, a good thing going on over here that we can, it's just like maybe in the airline industry where you have a captain that's very well experienced starting off you know, with a first officer that's a 20 year old or something and just starting off. So he's learning on the job. This can be like his father in aviation, you could say. He might end up calling him that based on the kind of relationship that they're having. But the main issue here is they're learning. And I think for, for the person that's in the position of power, um, the captain, so to speak, in this position, his job is not to oppress this other one to make sure he stays in that position, but is to empower this person, to, to lend him everything that he needs to develop his skills, to get to the same level, and even be happy for him or her if they advance to an even greater level, if they end up having even better skill, you know? I think it would be cool for a captain to sit back and just see his first officer literally just fly the aircraft, you know, from start till the till, till last. Then that speaks of you as a good good teacher, as a good captain. You know, you know you are safe. You know this guy uh, going to his own plane, uh, the passengers would be safe. So when that is not happening then uh, I think we have a problem when, when you have a teacher who insists on being the one that, you know, is always in the position of power, not empowering. That's a bit of a problem. So with this mommy daddy issue, I don't know exactly what goes on in, 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 in the religious or Christian circle that I've been, it really doesn't happen a lot, but I, I think that's, that's, that's my two cents into this whole, into this whole matter. It should boil down to, um, someone being given an opportunity to learn. Um, it's right to accept that someone can lead them, but this person that's leading them or in the position of power must actually do their duty to empower the other person and set them free. I mean, once, once you've trained your first officer, the goal is to let him be a captain of his own aircraft, you know, and fly off and go. Unfortunately, sometimes in religious circles, this, this, this doesn't happen. And uh, um, I'll digress a little bit. Um, and come back uh, for us who train in this profession and who come from uh, this faith traditions that have a very strong denominational background or history, it's very difficult for, for you to be empowered to the point where you can launch out. So um, a doctor can train and a doctor can start their own private practice with no issues from other doctors. A lawyer can train and a lawyer can start their own private practice with no issues from other lawyers. A teacher can train and start their own school, you know, with no issues. But a pastor can train and in many churches, especially this really big ones, you cannot be empowered to actually be your own man, you know, be your own leader, launch out you know and go you'll be called all sorts of names offshoot you know whatnot and, and again it boils down i think i think that's that's really not what should be happening uh and so we limit what the church can even do in terms of helping helping the society uh shepherdesses um pks <sighs> I think for me, I'm just beginning this journey because I was not a PK growing up. I'm, think, I'm, the, I'm the first person in my family to actually go this line. I actually, for me, uh, becoming a chaplain has been very helpful. Walking this chaplaincy journey has been very, very helpful because it helped me address a lot of issues that had to do with rejection. Because getting into ministry for me meant facing a lot of backlash, a lot of rejection. 
both from family and even friends. And um, I got to identify that it, you know, there's ways in which I respond to this with anger, you know, and, and stuff. And I'm still, I have to confess, I'm still struggling with that. So I did not know what it's like to grow in a pastoral family, like many of my peers who we are serving with right now, most of them were PKs or green pastoral families. I have no idea what it's like, what the struggles of a shepherdess or a pastor's wife were like until now I'm in the ministry and I'm beginning to see what my wife is struggling with and what my kids uh, are struggling with. So, but I agree, I think, there should be a distinction in what's my calling and who they are as yes, my family, but also as individuals and what's my burden should not be my, be their burden, you know, and it should be my role to actually protect them, you know, uh, from suffering the kind of abuse that maybe they might suffer if I don't protect them. And so I think there's a sense of responsibility that pastors should have or spiritual or religious leaders should have towards not just the people that they minister to but also to their families um setting boundaries you know uh, this is family and this is profession you know if i want to keep my family away from this let's say if i'm going to a job interview it's actually illegal to try and probe into okay who is your wife who are your kids you know what and factor all that into into the employment prospect i wasn't here for the discussion on hr but those are some of the things that happen believe it or not like it's literally tied there might be reasons why this is acceptable in some way but when professionally speaking many jobs and you go to many jobs uh, they don't consider who your spouse is you know but these things happen within the church circles you know like we are very keen to know okay who is your wife who are your kids you know how are they going to fit into our community you know of the church but this, I mean, it's just a regular spouse. These are just regular kids, you know? You don't have too high an expectation of them, which boils back down to the whole issue of perfection again. You know, they're human beings. They might stumble, they might fall, they might be truant, just like any other church member, you know? So it shouldn't be too much of a burden. Um, and I think we should, it should, even pastors shouldn't face too much of a backlash. And maybe this is what pastor's kids need for them to actually live a normal life without too much pressure. Uh, because of time, let me sh shift gears to the LGBTQ question uh, that had been raised. Um, I think this struggles the church has had, not just with now beginning with LGBTQ issues, but we've seen this with uh, different Super demographics. Mothers. Different, different demographics in the church. Um, for churches that have a global um, membership or global reach um, and sort of, so to speak, top-down leadership, okay. this is quite a big problem because you have sometimes a membership whose demographic is majority, perhaps a, a certain gender, let's say women, but you don't have that reflected in even leadership circles so you have a church where maybe 70 percent of the membership is women but a hardline stance women cannot serve you know you can kind of kind of wonder okay so how do you operate that church or you have a church where majority of the uh, population is you know from africa or south america and and you don't see that same demographic represented in in leadership but we are beginning to see progress towards that. And another issues are coming up, for instance, you know, LGBTQ question. And uh, this is a very touchy question. Sometimes we mix this with the whole issue of polygamy because I think it also depends here in the West, LGBTQ questions are discussed uh, big time. In Africa, it seems to be an outright, uh, uh, there seems to be an outright stance, or oh, we know what this is about, and we know which way we go. You remember what happened when Barack Obama came to Kenya and tried to talk about it. Uh, uh, Kenyatta came up and kind of just shut him down on the whole issue. <laughs> so, but the kind of issues that are going on in Kenya uh, or Africa, say, for instance, polygamy, 
you cannot even discuss those here in America. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you're coming to America, you have to sign and declare that you're not coming to practice polygamy. You know, it's, it's literally there in the laws that you shouldn't be practicing. So, so people, it's, it's sort of like a settled issue, people don't practice. But you actually, when you look at the society and what's going on, you kind of question that. So um, for the LGBTQ issue, I think it depends on, uh, again, demographics, which side of the world people are and how open they might be to, con to having these conversations. In Africa, I think the biggest issue here might not even be the LGBTQ question. It might even be the issue of polygamy where you have maybe elders serving that have got two, three, four, five, you know, wives or something, and uh, it's legal. Uh, and uh, this is in conflict with perhaps uh, scriptures, like, let's say for instance, or the church's position, but it's, it's an ongoing issue and the youth know, but this youth are the ones who are being disciplined for, you know, uh, maybe pregnancy out of wedlock. So, my, my argument is this, sometimes we major on minors. Here, here I'm gonna read for you a certain text and, uh, and, and, and you tell me what you think. From Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, from verse 49. Um, this is about Sodom and Gomorrah. And we usually know when we're talking about the LGBTQ question, uh, people always bring up uh, Sodom and Gomorrah as, as the example of what was happening there and God literally destroyed it. So, you know, and this is just, we're dealing with this on the surface. Now look at, look, look at what it says in the Bible. You know, it says in verse 49, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. Now here, the Bible gives the reasons why God did away with Sodom. You know, overfed, arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty, did detestable things before me. And then he says, Samaria did not commit half the sins you did. You have done more detestable things than they and have made your sisters seem righteous by all these things you have done. Can you imagine? This is the Bible talking about Israel, God's people saying that they have actually done worse than Sodom and Gomorrah, whom God did away with. And it, it talks about what was the problem of Sodom and Gomorrah. Being unconcerned about the major issues like poverty, you know, like sickness, like, um, you know, all this stuff that's going on, you know, like hunger, being completely unconcerned. And and when you look at where the church sometimes is, is majoring, you know, we make major issues of stuff like homosexuality and whatnot. But what have we done concerning the questions of unemployment, for instance, to create jobs so people can come out of poverty? You know, and those are the things that the Bible says God was very annoyed of and actually destroyed some generation way back because of these things. So um, yeah, I would say I would say um, um, we need to have much much more tolerance uh, within the religious communities, um, acceptance, uh, a listening ear, uh, love. Uh, we don't know what struggles people are having, you know. We don't know um, where they're coming from, what they're dealing with. I think we should, it should be more of how can I help rather than no, this is wrong. No, you need to do this. If not, you're out. So I think it should be more of, okay, how can we help? How can we be of help? Regardless of color, you know, race, gender, you know, sexual orientation and stuff like that. And I think if we speak to that, then we will see more of the world, maybe, or maybe the church gravitating more towards the world and becoming even more useful, not becoming more like the world, you know, but be transforming, you know, the world. It will be, there'll be a natural way for people to, um, to interact. And, and this, is, this is like what I said about, about uh, my experience in undergrad. 
where you have much of the studentship, you know, navigating quietly towards these leaders who, who you can go and tell them, by the way, you know, I'm actually struggling with drugs. And they will not tell on you. They will not snitch on you. They will not snitch on you. They will try to offer help. They'll tell you, by the way, you, you know, it's a real issue. You can see this counselor and that kind of, that is now real practical help. But just saying, no, drug abuse is wrong. Um, you're condemned. We're kicking you out of this school. You're not helping. We're not helping at all. And I think that happens even with the LGBTQ matter. And I think that's our answer to how we heal. Saya, you don't think so? Yeah, we just need empathy. We need grace. We need to listen more and judge less. We can yeah, talk to uh, like, Kwani. Yeah, yes, yes, Mukimba. Uh, uh, there's just something I've also really noted about this whole process, yeah? From healing from up comes with a lot of empowerment down. And healing from down <clears throat> comes with us choosing to also be empowered. I think you can't wait for the higher ups to make that decision. But I think knowing religion for yourself, knowing whatever relationship it is that you're entering into and choosing that empowerment. And then as well, the church or whatever religious situation you are in, choosing to empower you from top down and making sure that people have information, people are allowed to question, people are allowed to deal with situations with a lot of love and yeah, love and empowerment. I'm, I'm, I'm liking the, 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 the root of being empowered, whether it's through education or it's reading the scripture yourself or it's getting that therapy. Obviously I'm gonna be a huge advocate for mental health help, even for the pastors and the elders. I feel nobody should ever be in a position of power without getting some actual psychological assistance themselves. Because we all have stuff, we all have baggage, we all have things that we're working into. Okay, because we need to let um, Kenyans in Kenya eat. Um, so just, yeah. And uh, so last, yes, point Zamusha comments, Zibe Fupi Fupi. Um, and, and, and Dennis, if you're still on the call, yeah, you can, I think I've, I've allowed uh, participants to unmute. And if you have a question, just put it out here so that we don't traumatize you religiously. Yeah. Yes, Kate, go ahead. Uh, mine is to just summarize what you have actually just said. It's we, we are accepting that it's true, there's religious trauma. And uh, we have actually said that both the congregation and the pastor or everyone is vulnerable to actually uh, the religious trauma. And it, the good thing that you have said here is, yes, when you realize that you have actually gone through, that's not the end of it all. It's true, you can seek help. You have saying realizing is the first step. Getting help uh, is the second one. And third, you can actually join. We, as we said, there are people who have actually gone through whatever. Is it the unwanted pregnancy? Is it the, the like, um, Said about the unwanted pregnancies, we said about the uh, various groups that we put them through. Uh, you can actually go support, you can go to the support group. But in essence, we said something important. I can have a pre existing mental illness and I also go to church. So you see, having that history puts me like a, a more vulnerable to actually go through some stuff. And as we said, if you have any mental problem and you actually go through such a trauma, it can have an effect on you. So as we said, if you have ever had any pre-trauma, first of all, you have to get help. Once you get help, you're actually going to um, move on from them. We have, there's something about the support groups and cognitive behavioral therapy that has actually been put across. Something of note is, as I finish up is, what I've actually taken, take home message today is a change comes from, as we said, from me, from you. We need to get it out there that yes, there are things that are happening in church and there are ways we can actually handle it. You offer solutions, not by saying there is this problem, but you're not offering a solution. So it is the work of each and every person that has attended this meeting. You can strive and introduce in the church that you go to and say, 
I attended a meeting and this is what I learned about it, we can get the knowledge out there. Another thing that I noticed is there's unintentional abuse. Um, the person uh, may beat the parents, <coughs> the pastors beat the elders in the church. They can unintentionally, because of the beliefs they have, they can cause trauma. Mm. So first step is actually accepting that yes, they may actually just do it not because they they were not hurting you. Maybe they did it in good faith, this is helping you, but in essence ended up causing a harmful effect. So it all everything starts with you. If you realize and accept it and look for ways to help it, you can actually heal yourself from having to do what we just talked about. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Sai, so, you're itching? Yes, I'm itching to say a few things. One is trauma, um, religious trauma given, it, it exists. And it happens where there is a where there is a where there is a misbalance of important things. One is where there's not enough truth being told to power. And it doesn't matter the source of the power, whether it's the power the um, followers are able to exert over their leaders or the leaders exert over their followers when there's no truth being able to be told um, to power. And that can be designed, that can be through design or default. So that's one source. And then second source, I realize of trauma within religious circles is when either people who have not resolved previous traumas or people who feel inadequacy in one area end up misleveraging religious structures or religious texts to either insulate themselves or reaffirm themselves or deal with their proclivities. That is the environment within which trauma happens. Then let me just put a caveat here and say, you never judge a religion or you never judge an ideology by its abuse but you judge it by its logical unfolding. So I think all religious dispositions have been abused. Um, and I don't, I don't hope this discussion is one for discrediting Islam or Hinduism or Christianity. But this is saying like, hey, if the discussion of whether is Islam right or is Christianity right is a totally different thing. We don't judge uh, faith by its abuse, but we judge it by its logical outworking. I think the path there for to recovery and the path to doing well lies in a few things. Be being a Christian, I will use a Christian text to help. The Apostle Peter writes and says, now therefore set apart Jesus Christ in your hearts that you may have a reason for the faith you have come to believe in, but do so with humility. So Peter, who hung out with Jesus for three and a half years, he eventually tells guys, no, this thing is not just a feelings thing or an excitement thing. He says like, yeah, set apart Christ have in your hearts, have reasons, you know, like, so A, um, people need to have information, the right amount of information. Two, yes, faith and reason need to be paired together. Otherwise things can get unhinged. And um, three, the communication of this, Peter says, needs to be done with gentleness and with, with meekness. We need to have the humility to listen as well as the humility to um, sp when speaking. And then I think a second thing that needs to be re-embraced is the culture of questioning. We, um, the moment questions are either not welcome or they are avoided or they are not answered, you're creating a perfect breeding ground for trauma. So I think whichever religious education you get from childhood up, part of healing the trauma is normalizing questions. One thing I like in my faith tradition is every Saturday morning, every Sabbath morning, um, we have a time to study um, God's word. You know, it's called lesson study. And um, at the lesson study, it's it's flat. The, the, the playing field is flat because I, we, we read the same material. So you're able to ask questions. Somebody can raise a question. Somebody can raise an opinion. You can disagree and everything. I find that very, very, very um, empowering. And I think more faith traditions need to be done that in addition to the communication that's done from the pulpit to the audience. I think this one where people can break into small groups, question their faith, interrogate it properly before they settle in is an important thing. But we should structure our religious spaces so that they become more tolerant for questions. Because questions are powerful in showing true motive, 
in answering the real need and being able to spotlight things that are not um, brought to the surface very easily. And then thirdly is we will need professional help. I totally agree. Many individuals, many traumatized or people with issues are in leadership positions. So whether it is um, ensuring that our retraining or whichever religious training, you're being trained to be an elder or a mama guild, mama region, you know, um, representative of what, I think mental health should be one of the training pieces given. And then secondly is competence. So if for instance, you're put to be in charge of a particular docket, it's not just the Bible or the Quran that should be taught to you. You should also be given the skills to make you competent. Because once you're competent, a few things happen. A, you're not operating from a point of insecurity, hence meeting out more insecurity to people. Um, I think those would be my takeaway statements and proposals for solutions on the way forward. Oh yeah, oh, one, one, one important thing. I think every faith tradition needs to normalize owning up and admitting. Because you see when um, screw ups have happened, screw ups are not private. They are, you know, the, 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 the children sodomized is public. Um, churches that are embezzled is public. Churches that are fighting, that's as public. And trying to theologize it around or um, guilt trip people around doesn't work. I think it is more powerful when people step forward like um, Bargeglio, um, the current Pope, I was able to, to step forward and say like, hey, hey, mistakes have happened over here and then beginning the process. It gives the institution a lot more credit because hey, um, our homes have staff that we need to sort, our workplaces have staff that we need to sort out. So we're not expecting that churches that draw from people taken from our homes and our society that are broken will in themselves be perfect. Therefore, I think churches, mosques, um, uh, temples, should resist this temptation of wanting to project a perfect persona mm -hmm. and instead admit when these things are happening. And finally, give the legal, give, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. At times some trauma things have been perpetuated because we have spiritualized that which is legal or we have spiritualized that which is medical. Okay, so if, if, if someone is embezzling church money, okay, and making people therefore have to keep changaing and stuff, we don't just pray that away. We don't saw that by administratively moving the person. I think the person needs to face legal redress. Okay. If somebody is abusing girls or, or, or in the case of single mothers, a lot of the times it's happening is the guy who's the father to the baby is still holding a church position and stuff, a legal redress, you know? the children's court exists for things like that. It's not just sufficient that you remove that person from the church's books or you keep them out of the mosque. That sorts the religious side, but it still communicates the message that we are more concerned about how we appear publicly than really addressing the need for this baby or the needs for this mother or the need for this um, father in that particular case. So I think we need a return to healthy leveraging of legal systems when that arises. I think in that ballpark of things lies the solutions for people. Okay. <clears throat> and for the um, audience members, if anyone has a question or a burning issue, Dennis, I have uh, given you permission. You can ask a question for one minute. I think we can, um, uh, my, 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 final, my final thoughts are um, like, you see this Vaseline container that's always behind me. Uh, you may think it's there by mistake, but until you uh, I've made you alerted to it, um, you wouldn't know it's there. And that's what we are trying to alert some people. Some people may not know that religious trauma or what they're experiencing is religious trauma, but we've put a name to it. We have secured our, our uh, spiritual relig religious buildings with insurance, padlocks, and all that stuff. But what we need to also ensure are the people who go in there and just to ensure and fortify them from emotional abuse, emotional trauma, and all this other um, trauma. Who has raised their hand? Ninani, I mean, no. Huh? Is it Dennis again? I can't see who. Yeah, oh, it's 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 Amy. Amy. Oh, Amy. Hi, Amy. Go ahead. 
it's indicated Amy. My name is Priscilla. Oh, okay. that's my daughter's name. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you so much for having this conversation whose time has come. And um, I had a question which wasn't answered in the chat. Was this being recorded? Because some of us came in late and I feel like uh, it's a weighty matter. I it's, 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 on, then, it's, on, it's on Facebook Live. I'm gonna post. Oh, uh, so you're gonna resend to the rest of us. Because I know you don't have my number, but Saya does. So I would truly appreciate him forwarding it to me. Um, I don't know where to start because I'd started interjecting at the point where uh, you asked about PKs or those of us who've undergone that kind of trauma where you ran to the church and the church told you you are strong enough to handle yourself. And um, then you, when I listened to it, I felt like, yeah, you guys actually understand what you're saying from your congregations, from interactions with people that, well, why not give the church a manual plus at least help them by recommending that every pastor has to undergo uh, some counseling of sorts that they need to grasp that aspect. Because today we were having a meeting, uh, my church is in Nairobi Central. Today we were having a meeting where parents were wondering why we are going to have a campori and uh, like, is it being toughened by situations where they are just being made to be difficult by the union, like there will be no water for drinking in the campori, and uh, that is okay as per the union standards for the, the, like we're being advised, we still go. Like our children still go. They are in the wilderness for crying out loud. Like since when did part of not providing what's a legal requirement, a part of toughing out, as in the, the, but finder leaders had a hard time trying to actually calm down the parents like, no, it's not a requirement of pathfinder rules that there should be some hardship that the children should experience. If it happened as an oops, you know, like we forgot cups. We were given a nice example of cups were forgotten one time in Nairobi and they were in Zavo and they had to use milk cartons for cups for that week. That's fine. But now not providing water or having children going to uh, pitch tents uh, in rock or a swampy area for a whole week, people come back with Bilhazia. And that is the headship of our church. It's the union, not even the conference. It's not fair that these are the leaders. I actually said in that meeting, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation here, that our pastors need to undergo psychological counseling for the traumas that were inflicted upon them that they seem to think have to be the, the, the traumas that we also have to experience. Because I, I am undergoing divorce um, because of something that catastrophically happened between my husband and I. But I've reached a point where I'm like, I think maybe Sai and a few others and I are the only people who might be thinking to pray for this guy. Like they've not, I had Steve also saying it and that might not be already giving up, like you've already condemned him to die where Christ has not yet even called the situation to, you know, like you've already condemned this person and you're already saying that they should be left to the dogs, literally. Someone just told me, move on. And I'm like, I'm not crying for his soul because I have lacked moving on. I'm crying for his soul because he is a fellow human being and I can see from what I know about this situation is there are some things when he's doing them, they are a cry for help. Now, when the person I'm turning to help is telling me uh, <laughs> that one, the devil has already taken control. I don't know, maybe I'm venting. Sorry, Posa. No, it's but... okay. Is this Chris Masigisi? <laughs> yes. I, I, so, okay. I, I feel like the Adventist church we need like our own religious, I, I th okay, this is my suggestion. I think every church, cause we understand the nuances, we need like our own, you know, like a religious trauma camp, like just to talk exactly. about, yeah, because you see Mukimba does not understand Pathfinder and all that stuff. I get uh, the, the 
uh, Steve and, and Sire and myself, are, it, this is the three to two ratio of Adventist yes. to non Adventist, and it's just by, by because um, Adventist. We need to have that conversation. I don't know what to say. No, I understand because you see, I'm getting support outside of Adventism. Yeah. I'm getting support uh, outside of Adventism, and yeah. I've realized it is. It is in other churches too, it's in mosques, it's in uh, Buddhist uh, temples and all, that there are times when people don't understand how to handle a situation that they, they, they react to you. So when we are getting the help, then we can come back and say, can we do something about it? Yeah. For instance, after undergoing uh, divorce care, it's in Northern America, but apparently it's not in Africa at all, except in Pentecostal churches and uh, other non-Adventist uh, institutions. So I'm like, okay, can I be the guinea pig who will be able to bring this to our setup and our church? Because it is truly needed because some of us have been handled like, like you know, if, if divorce is a disease someone else might catch from me. So I... I, I had to step aside from so many things so that I can also understand myself apart from trying to understand what's happening to me, to people from people whom I thought were my friends, you get. Yeah. So um, having undergone all that, there is, okay. For me, I didn't stop to pause and ponder and say, okay, uh, this church has really breathed me because I've had three issues in my life in the, in the span of being in church that, were are breathing that I actually realized that they don't know any other way to react except that. But now here are younger people who come to me because they're so broken and it's the church that is inflicting this on them. So what you are actually advising, it should be not an idea whose time has come, but it should be an implementation already with the board, like the GC board to say within the next three years, we should have this in place because there are people who are coming out of COVID with COVID trauma from how the church reacted to them. Like when you coughed, everyone wanted to stigmatize you. And so there will be many other things that will keep uh, assailing. And then we will be keeping them all together and saying, okay, we need to discuss. No, it's not yet time to say that anymore. It's time to say we have um, like, call it disaster management because really it's a disaster how churches react to some of these things. There are pastors who are disfellowshipped for handling uh, divorce matters in their Pentecostal churches. And um, there were people who were forced, there was a Muslim who was telling a conversation of how they were forced back together uh, because it didn't meet the criteria for what the Imam had thought he should handle of what they were discussing. But this person was actually suffering in their marriage. And for a while, until they left the country, they were forced to actually have a marriage where it had already, for all practical purposes, broken down. And um, when, we, when we just want to gloss over it, I feel like out of this conversation today, there should be a paper that uh, the likes of uh, Pastor should be sending to the headquarters. For those of us who are Adventists, I'm still doing the, I'm looking at the three as the entire group. Sorry, Posa. Not yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mukimba way. and Kate, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, please. I'm please sorry. apologize I'm, on my Yeah, I'm, I'm apologizing on behalf of other Adventists because the trauma in our church is a lot. Yeah, it's it's a lot. We don't speak about it, but it's, it's, it's a lot. And please, I think we can touch base, you, I, and Saya, maybe, and just think yes. through yes, stuff yeah yeah we can think through stuff we'll throw in steve over, over there but if someone has because it's a it's a lot Thank and I, I, yeah it's a lot okay steve i don't know okay. steve just go yeah, ahead is gc doing okay gc is general conference adventist it's like our headquarter yeah year to year our adventist our sabato but let's, because it's the same mm -hmm. thing that's going through other churches. People are, may not speak about it. And as uh, Adventists are loud and proud out there, let's just be the guinea pig for today. Okay, Steve, just go ahead. Well, um, I'm glad you opened up the, 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 the floor. This is what I was wondering about. And even when I started, I said, you know, um, it would be nice if, and also, also sad, you know, because I expected 
something like this might come up at least to give the as a sense of how heavy this issue is and how serious it is because otherwise we might just you know it might just look like well we're just talking about something that you know doesn't, doesn't exist. exist but this yeah. this is stuff that that causes significant suffering you know to people um sometimes even leads to death uh, it's 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 unfortunate so um thank you pris for really you know opening up and being vulnerable with us um uh, your situation and my heart really goes out to you um and let me begin by saying pole sana you know um to every one of you who's here that has had trauma you know um courtesy unfortunately of folks like me um and i'm sure i have caused this also in one way or another like i think bukimba said sometimes also unintentionally but like sai also said we need to own up you know we need to own up when it has happened and say pole and sit on the table and say okay what uh what can we do what can we do going forward so um but i think getting back to what pris uh also said um this this problem part of this problem is because of the controlling nature of religious organizations um they become very controlling to the extent that we tend to think we are self sufficient or these organizations tend to think they're self sufficient and it's not just a particular denomination the, these characteristics are just across the board so people love whatever church they go to and they would love to find solutions there but for all practical purposes there's not one institution that is you know all complete you know that has everything so we need to um be open to the fact that it's okay to go out there and find someone else you know who has the professional expertise or maybe the skills that you need to find healing or help to get to the next level and so um if it is not happening let's say in the seventh day adventist church that we are lacking let's say in terms of uh um emotional support um like professionals who can help you you know deal with that but it's available in the baptist or maybe pentecostal church um we need to accept the fact that there's no need to reinvent the wheel when there's we already have a a wheel that works somewhere that's what empowerment is all about and that's what um um i think the bible says the body of christ should should work together you know um so if let's say another congregation has a certain gift why shouldn't i allow myself to just go there and yeah, find yeah. find healing and then yeah. you know continue you know this is exactly what we see happening with uh, with like the Syrophoenician woman you know coming to Christ because she saw the something and 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 it was okay to give that and Christ was actually uh actually recognized how difficult it was at that time to in to, to go across certain borders but he allowed it he allowed the healing to flow across so um some barriers need to be broken down and 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 i think the church speaking um uh, of the christian uh uh religious persuasion the church needs to own up to the fact that its leader came down to break down walls of petition came down to break down these walls of petition that we we sometimes try to erect so so hard you know on us by ourselves you know this denomination says this is the border that you cannot cross is a border you cannot cross the mark while christ says i came to wipe all these things out it's a level playing field like uh, saya said you know uh so for me i think someone like priest you should be empowered and not feel guilty <laughs> to go beyond <laughs> the borders if you're sick in kenya and you cannot find your treatment in kenya it is okay to take your passport to fly out to india get your treatment get healed and come back there's absolutely that nothing wrong with doing that is just the way it works let whoever says whatever they want to say say it 
but you come back and say, you know, I don't, I don't know whatever you're saying, but I know who healed me, you know, just like the person who came and said, you know, they wanted asking him very weird questions. And I don't know any of that. I just know the man who opened my eyes. So it is okay. It is okay. And I think people need to be affirmed. People that are suffering and struggling and need to find help, you cannot be condemned for trying to find help. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. Especially if the person who is telling you that is not even offering an option uh, for you to do that. So, um, <laughs> Steve, like, that, Steve, that needs to be like amplified. It's okay. We Adventists copied the Pathfinder movement from the scouting movement. Our order of service is from the, is it the Methodists? It's not our own. So we, we, we and, and this is, goes to other churches, I'm sorry, it's, it's not an SDA meeting, we just happen to be Adventists. Sire has had to drop out because he's um, too much. Um, and please thank you for being vulnerable, especially because this is recorded. We need to talk and, and we need to make life better and less painful and less traumatized human beings out there. We need to talk about it, Steve. I don't think I I would say whatever you said any better. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dennis. Dennis, go ahead. And if anyone else is banning, I know I'm not for what we call trauma. Upon just talking about our trauma because it re-traumatizes other people. But if this is the only space you can get a voice, we are here. We can stay on for a little for a little longer so that you know there are people out here who care. Okay. Uh for for me i'll be fast and then I'm, I'm trying to go back you know for me i look at it from the point of view where did the rain start beating where did all this start and th this is based on my opinion and i stand corrected uh i'm dennis and i have been i've resided in the united states for 20 years now born raised adventist and i've had enough experience from both sides, you know, the African side, and there's the African mentality of religion and the Western side. Now, when we, we, we let's not forget that religion was brought to us by the white man in a white man's language. It was not in our language. There's a connection between language and culture. So we did not take time to do what Sai was saying, to get a deeper understanding of religion, deeper understanding of the Bible. We took religion as in the face value because we had to learn a new language to, to read the Bible. So you no, know, it was a task run, learning a new language. We didn't have time to look at the Bible deeply and figure out what was going on, right? So what happened, is that all those Olebon, all those, uh, we just took the, the religion that was brought from the West and substituted with our African cultural religions. So we took Olebon, took him out of the picture and substituted with church. Pretty much that's what it is. And we took it for face value. And if you get to understand all these prophets in Africa, religious leaders, they had standards that had to be attained and that's what we put in our churches in africa we have standards we set standards we set bars in that for you to be somebody to be recognized as somebody who's religious or spiritual you have to reach to a certain standards and bars and to me i think that's like oppressive because god love doesn't work like that and this is something that I experienced when I was young. Because, you know, when you walk in a room and you, you find a couple of guys and you, you tell them, you know, you share the word of the Bible, you pray. If they were Africans, immediately they will take you as a Christian and they will put standards on your head to a point that you cannot say about something or talk about something because they'll be like, oh, I thought you were in Mtuamu. I thought you were a Christian. Why can you, you know? So it kind of traumatized people like us because there is a graph that Paul has showed about young people and I am a millennial. And right now my generation has left church because of those standards that have been set. 
which is becoming, which the church says, if you don't get to these standards, you not, we cannot take you as one of us. Okay, because when I was a teenager going to church, we could, me and friends of mine were five of us, we could see that there were some issues where the church needed help, especially the youth department, and we had solutions, we had ideas. But the problem is the, star, the, the bars or the standards that were put in that church were too high for us that we had to stand down. Okay, those standards make you, they tamper with your self-esteem. They make you feel like you're not worthy of any position or to say anything in that church because you have not reached the standards. You have not gotten to the bar. They don't even trust you, you know? And that's how me growing up in a Seventh-day Adventist church went through. It kind of affected my self-esteem. Right now, we were, I had five friends who used to go to church with and all of them left the church. None of them is in the church. I'm the only one. And they got to a point where they couldn't take it anymore. You know, because we Africans took religion on face, but we did not go deeper to understand the criteria, the love of God, what God had intended to us because Coming to the West, it's kind of different because like um, when you see these movies, if you're, a, if you're a fan of Netflix, you see all these movies about drug cartels in South America. These guys are warlords, but they have church. They go to church. They have some aspect of religion in them. You, you go to New York, you see the mafias, they go to church. You know, they sing the Hail Mary. They, they go to church and they go to a Catholic church and they confess their sins. You see gangsters going to church. But in Africa, if I was a known criminal and I went to a church in Africa, people would run away from that church because I've not reached the standards. I'm not qualified to be there. You know, and, and like there's a lady who said about divorce here, and this is something even my wife and I, we, we realized and we, you know, it took us time to consume it. it, it like, like somebody said, you know, divorce in SDA is a big no. And in, in Africa, when couples divorce, they don't even go to church anymore. They stop going to church because the way the church will look at them. But here in the West, the church that we go to, there are so many couples who are divorced, but they still come to church. You know, and it's, they still come to church, they worship, they, they, life goes on, you know. So there's a way these people have seen church or embraced church that us back in Africa, we took it as face value. We didn't get to understand what, you know, that church is a hospital for the sick people. It's not a hospital for who are healthy. And then another thing I wanted to add was about the, uh, this thing called homosexuality. Now, from my experience, I have a son and a daughter. And we, people from Africa and the diaspora who live in the West, this is a topic we like avoiding. We don't talk much about this topic of homosexuality and LGBT because there's a saying which says, you know, you can leave the village, but the village will never leave you we still have that holding on to our culture that, you know, we are in a country where it's more liberal, so we don't want to talk. You know, it, we kind of, you know, look on the other side. We don't want to get more into it. And when you become a parent like me, you know, you get to a point, my wife and I, we have come to a point, you know, we always, we, we accepted and said, you know, we, we don't care what religion or race our kids will marry into or where they'll get married, but we're just praying is not somebody of the same gender. That's something we say it quietly. We don't say it openly because even that's, because that's something in our culture is kind of hard to let us go. So when we're in a church and people start talking about homosexuality and LGBT, it kind of makes us, look down we, we we can't be vocal you know and then what 
question I had to ask, a question I had for the panel, anybody can answer it. C can we say that the fact that the church has set standards and bars that, that need to be reached to. Can we say this is a form of exercising power or some kind of oppression that it's mental to a point that a lot of young people are leaving church because of this. They can't take it anymore. You know, there's a big number of millennials who are out there, they just dropped out of church. Can we say this is a form of exercising power and oppression on the people in the religious cycle to control them by just setting star bars and standards that everybody has to attain to, to be gotten into? Because this thing affected me in that it, it, it messed with my self-esteem. Because every time I could go to that church, I used to feel like, I'm a nobody, I'm nothing, I'm, I'm not even worth it to, these people even, when they say hi to me, I feel scared because they have already judged me that me and my friends, you know, we are just some little devils coming to church. It really affected me, my self-esteem, and that's why all my friends, they left church, they couldn't take it anymore. But I stayed in because of, you know, at least my backup system was my family, you know, my family was there because my family even made me understand everybody's messed up. Our family, we're all messed up. So you're not the first one. You know, so to me, the, my family kind of took that obligation of being my mentor and, you know, giving me hope because they saw it in me that I had this potential, but I was scared doing it in church because, you know, women the church, people are seeing you. You're just somebody who likes drinking, having fun and, they don't take you in as serious. They take you as a joker. You know what I'm saying? So can setting star bars and standards a way of oppression in religious cycles and exercising power? Thank you. Steve, Steve I think you're the only one remaining. Everyone else, because mm -hmm. of the time, had to drop off. Um, if you could take that, and if anyone has a burning issue and uh, need to close it up so that you, you all can eat um, dinner, and we can look for a way to discuss this in a different way with different religious organizations so that, I don't know, we need to talk about it more. I feel like it's, it's Nikki Donda. Oh, Kate is back. Oh, okay. Kate is back. <laughs> Kate is back. Everyone else had, had to leave. Oh, Steve, just take a stab yeah. at what all that, um, yeah, that was said. Well, thank you. Thank you for what you shared, uh, Dennis. Um, uh, I think, uh, just like we say, education sometimes uh, is, is quite an eye opener. Um, also traveling around the world a little bit is also quite an eye opener because it's also education in some sense and not necessarily the one of the books, but of life and experiences. So um, mm -hmm. when you travel to like Europe and, 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 and the US here and um, you see how, uh, religion operates and you compare that with um, how things happen in Africa, for instance, then you begin picking traits of, you know, uh, Western influence that are just cultural influence and are being propagated as, 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 as truly biblical or spiritual or, or necessary. For instance, you know, uh, fine. Uh, I know in Africa, for instance, if I was to dress up in my African attire and I'm supposed to preach and I showed up in a church on, you know, on, on the day of worship to go and preach, there are some churches that would, uh, would probably stop me from going to, <laughs> going to the pulpit. Why? Because I am not in a suit and a tie. But where did the suit and the tie come from? You know, uh, it did not come from Africa. Uh, it, it's, it's a Western attire that has now been spiritualized and looks like the thing that is right for whoever is going up there to preach. And so what was um, uh, something really nice, creative that 
you know, that was designed by an African, you know, is not even appreciated in an African context. And uh, the church is propagating this. So uh, sometimes when you travel and you see, for instance, in America, I mean, how often do you see people dressed up in suits, you know, even, even, even in church, you know, very, very rarely, very rarely would you see that. But the way we, we have our, our perspective of suits and stuff is just totally different, you know. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I thank you for sharing that, that perspective. There are certain cultural aspects of um, Western culture that came into Africa and were embraced as part of Christianity, but they were not really Christianity. It was just a cultural aspect of, of the missionary that came with the word. So that, 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 that word should have been contextualized, you know, should have been embraced within the African context. Okay, yeah, we've heard this. So how does this apply to us as Africans in Africa, operating in Africa, you know? And, and I think um, we still have a long way to go in that front, uh, whether, you're talking of, whether you're talking of Christianity, even whether you're talking of Islam or maybe even Hinduism, whatever religion, um, what are the cultural aspects, you know, that come with that religion and kind of tell you that yours is not worthy, you know, ours is the one. So we need to, we need to really identify those and say, ah, no, 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 no. And, and, and embrace ourselves for who we are as Africans and be empowered for who we are. And when we had begun, you know, Saya really touched uh, a nerve, you know, when, when he, he touched on the macro issues of, of what we're talking about. You know, we're not just talking, right now we are, we are at the micro levels where we're talking about certain traumas within uh, individual levels. But when you look at, 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 at subjects like slavery, for instance, and colonization, for instance, those are macro issues of trauma that affect you know whole generations and and unfortunately they've been propagated from a religious front you know and so you have these issues that are pervasive in an entire in an entire continent or in an entire demographic courtesy of a certain religious you know front so i think what you've said dennis is really uh, true and vital uh, but also what you've said about acceptance you know uh, in church or wherever you're going to worship um pole pole that you didn't find this where you should have found and that's why we are having this, this conversation um yeah and and yeah. and for 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 books um i'm currently reading the one on the right side of the screen it's very eye-opening it's um it's, it's a very good book about how we misread scripture. And I've, I've been challenging Sire to write one for misreading um, scripture with West East, if, if this is West East, Eastern eyes. And the other um, 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 books that are, yeah, these ones, um, Growing Young, uh, these three books I would recommend. And Diane Langbang, anything she posts on YouTube is very well done. Like she's done. I took a deep dive into her stuff while I was preparing for this um, this talk. We need okay, to just, just one one more thing, but okay. I can answer Dennis's question. I think we had answered it before, but maybe I can reiterate it about <clears throat> perfection. The whole question of perfection, people being expected to be perfect as they are coming to church. Um, it's unfortunate that that's uh, the perception that. Um, a lot of us have heard, you know, going into, you know, into church, like you, you get the feeling that, man, unless, unless you can, you measure up to a certain standard, then you shouldn't even be here. You know, unfortunately, I think that shouldn't be the case. And my personal perspective and my personal take on this, and I'd, I'd always push it. This one's something I'll push. You know, although it's not good to push things, but this one, this one I'd push is, and I think it's, it's okay to push it. Why? Because God left his throne and came. That's the whole story of the Bible. And, and I wonder why we don't push that. It's all about God leaving his throne, leaving heaven, becoming human, you know, living with us, you know, and walking this journey with us. So if God can do that, don't let anybody tell you that uh, where you are, 
you need to measure up first before you can come over here. So they can stay with wherever they want. They can stay on that pedestal, leave them alone. God already left a higher pedestal, you know, and came to your level. So you can walk, you can walk with him. So, and I think this, that's, that's, that's the good news that, you know, uh, we can embrace our brokenness, you know, and we can try to find solutions, you know, with each other among ourselves and speaking of the christian faith tradition it says god is here to help us among us to help us like one of us you know walking with us this journey so i think um if this is what you're feeling you know from leadership that you need to measure it's, it's just wrong um where it's coming from i cannot say uh fully it might come from different quarters but i know that wherever you are wherever any one of us is, however unworthy we might feel, uh, you're not unworthy. Let me just say that. We are not unworthy. You can make it. You can make it. And you can start the healing journey. Regardless of what has happened to you, you can walk this journey step by step and let nobody tell you that you can do it. That's what I can, that's what I'll just say. If God is for you, who can be against you? Sorry, I'm preaching, but, but, but it's just what the Bible is saying. And it's sad, it's sad that we, a lot of people who are here, actually Christians, but, you know, empowering texts, sometimes are sidelined and discouraging texts are the ones that are drummed on people. You know, it's just sad. It's just sad. Okay, we now need to close. It's almost three hours. Yeah. We'll need to have more of these conversations, I feel. I'm just thinking, no, it's me thinking through. We'll need to have more of these conversations and and we can tell them. Sorry, Costa, for interrupting. Costa, okay. sorry for interrupting, but when I posted this in a different group, someone asked me that, can they do this periodically? So over to you. Oh. Steve, just... you, uh, okay, the panelists who are here, that's, who is Keta Amanda Pen? Uh, okay, we, we can, but I, I am stubborn, obstinate and difficult sometimes but because I, I want to dis, i would want to discuss it in a different way not the same i cannot do the same thing again it will bore me to death but if they can if they want a different perspective looked at we can do that does that make sense please great that would be great yeah if if and yeah reach if you reach sire because i am um, Again, people have asked me to, to open a Facebook page, a WhatsApp group. Uh, no, I am stubborn, obstinate, and impossible. I do not have those. The page I, I, I use is Sire's page because he, he is out there. My work is a moderator and just making us talk through these um, difficult subjects and subjects that we've never talked about. So I'm sorry, I don't have a WhatsApp. I'm not gonna create a WhatsApp group. The notifications will drive me crazy. I will not open a Facebook page, but we uh, post on on um on on the on on the authentic dialogue with Sire, and I'm always open to just look at this from a different um, perspective, because uh, I feel like it's the burden the Lord put on my heart, if that makes sense. So Steve, of course, will come back. Yeah, um, so so we appreciate you, Walter, also. We really appreciate what you're doing, you know, um, going out of your way to actually um, try and organize this kind of conversations. Um, yeah, we, we can clearly see the need is there, just like Prisa said. And these are just baby, baby steps. Um, we will grow. I think we will grow with it, with time. Uh, so if, if, if what you really need cannot be offered for now, for anyone who is here please don't be discouraged you know mm -hmm. uh, um i think what we need to do uh, uh, for beginning is just appreciate even what is happening for now thank you so much Pastor, actually for even organizing this i hope that this has just been helpful even if it's in one or two ways to give you strength maybe for for a day or for a week for a year maybe um yeah that's what i can say and I'll ask the the the, the team of uh, uh, um, coaches and therapists I work with to just post 
on the on the on the same link on the on the on the authentic dialogue with Sire. Uh, this where the video will is uh, is uh, currently broadcasting, uh, so that they can post their contacts, so that you can talk to them. Patrick, I'm not opening a WhatsApp group. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for um, the questions. Yeah, and thank you for for realizing that 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 you're not a lost cause. Um, is it Jackie or Aki? I don't know how to um, yeah to to pronounce it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Steve. I will thank the rest who are not here. Uh, thank you very much. Next. Next month, we are moving to transitions because, yeah, it's a sad thing. Um, so transitioning from one point of life to the other and why we get stuck. And the other month we are going to um, talk about now um, addiction. So substance use and process, you know, the gambling and all those things, uh, the things we, uh, we use to take away the pain from the traumas we've endured. And if you go to the Authentic Dialogue page, We've discussed work in this trauma, we've um, school in this trauma, and this one, and the parenting one. I think when when you talk about these things and share them, we are going to heal the world one person at a time, and that's and that's my my desire. Yeah, Karibu uh, sana. you can live at your own. In Ivo, yeah, you can you can live. Thank you, thank you. This has been three hours of talking. Thank. I didn't think we. We would get here about three hours, yes. Thank you. Asante Nisana now. Thank you again. Blessings yeah. on you all. Okay. Uh, uh, good night and have a good dinner. Ekwani, Saya Lienda. Saya Lienda. He had to, um, he, you know, he's going back to, oh, let me stop recording. Alienda? <laughs> <laughs>